Okay, Mayor and Council, we are live on YouTube. Thank you. One more minute. Okay, I have two o'clock, so we will call to order our regular meeting of council. And before we start, we will recognize that we are holding our meeting on the unceded traditional territories of the Hoopachesset and Sashot First Nations. Council, we do have an agenda in front of us. Are there any late items to be added by councillors? Councillor Solda? Uh, to do with the update on the settlement of longstanding RCMP issues, would you want that to be in with the RCMP report, Madam Mayor, or? Yeah, I think that could be um, a comment that we could just discuss at that point. Um, that's what really already okay. on our agenda um, with the reserve fund. So um, yeah. I don't think that needs to be added. Any okay, other just items? wanted to check. Sure, any other items for council to add? Okay, seeing none, any late items from staff? No, Madam Mayor. Great, thank you. And we will just provide notice that we are, um, of course, live streaming this, um, broadcasting on YouTube. And just a remind, reminder to members of the public, um, we do have an email address, um, council at portalberni.ca. If people would like to um, submit questions for public input period or for question period at the end. So you can email during the meeting and that will be monitored for the end of meeting. So with that, would somebody like to move approval of our agenda? I'll move. Agenda. Madam Mayor. Okay, moved and seconded. All in favor? Carried, thank you. And we have minutes from the special meeting held at 10.30 a.m. on July 13th, 2020, and July, 20, July 20th, 2020, and the regular meeting of council held at 2 p.m. on July 13th, 2020. Somebody like to move to adopt? Move to adopt. Move to adopt. Okay, Second. Seconded by Councilor Solda. Thank you. Any comments on the minutes? Councilor Corbiel. Yeah, just in regards to um, the, uh, we directed staff to um, uh, to convert the request for proposal for the train station to an expression of interest. Uh, have we, or are we going to do a, um, an evaluation, uh, a seismic evaluation? It would seem to me before we move too far down that road, we should have a bit better idea of you know what's what's needed before we uh, we put it out for a request. Okay, um, so CAO, if you want to just briefly comment on that, and then um, I just the, it, it not really the um, right time to bring it forward as this is just whether or not the minutes are correct. But um, Tim, you can probably provide a, a quick response to that without us getting into too much of a conversation. Sure, Madam Mayor. Um, I, we had no intention of doing a specific um, seismic evaluation of the building, but the um, the RP document does include information around the um, the building uh, re requirements to bring it up to current code as well. So that that'll all be part and parcel. The code encompasses seismic um, stability. Okay, thank, thank you. you. And Councillor Corbiel, um, you certainly, if you have more questions or want to provide further direction for staff. Um, we could discuss that further under new business, just as a note, if you do want to discuss it more. Any questions or comments further on the minutes? Okay, seeing none um, on adoption of the minutes, all in favor? Carried, thank you. And public input period, which is an opportunity for the public to address council on topics of relevance to city council. Um, and we will take a maximum of four submissions um, read out loud by the city clerk. City clerk, did we have any input today? Um, just one, Madam Mayor. It's from uh, Mr. John Douglas, and uh, he has submitted uh, for public input a full copy of the letter that council received as part of their correspondence log uh, last week. So taking some information from that, uh, Mr. Douglas says this evening, I received a phone call at my personal residence from a distraught senior citizen. Uh, the concern was over the unexplained closure of our one and only waterfront recreational area on the Port Alberni Inlet, Canal Beach. 
Uh, a reason of concern was that city staff uh, when called on two separate occasions, were unable to provide specifics regarding testing frequency and specific results. I explained to this individual that I've also written and phoned on the matter and have been met with similar responses, even though the current Island Health testing site for all Vancouver Island beaches indicates that Canal Beach is green in terms of results and therefore is very acceptable for swimming activities. He goes on to say one of the byproducts of uh, this lack of openness is, of course, the rumor mill that is generating. Um, he comments on common practices when a beach or other area is closed due to health re reasons is to provide the reason and to provide reasonable updates in most cases daily and publicly, for example, on a website and on a bulletin board at the specific location. It also in this case would be reasonable to have provided to the public the test results of alternative swimming sites, such as River Road, Paper Mill Dam and Sprout Lake Provincial Park. It is my understanding that none of these other sites are ever tested, which begs another question for another time. Uh, he references uh, the city uh, considering spending $250,000 on something as unrecreational and sedentary as a giant movie screen. Me meanwhile, we have much healthier and less expensive opportunities right at our doorstep and they are being ignored. To sum up, our swimming pool has been for some time and continues to be closed. People want, uh, all people want is a simple swim. Please give them their beach back, be open with your citizens and perhaps regain their trust and support. And it's from John Douglas on Motion Drive. Thank you. Um, could I just ask, um, it, we had discussed having an item on this agenda um, regarding Canal Beach, um, and I don't think we do. Um, is the Director of Parks, Recreation and Heritage available to speak to this later in our meeting? Uh, yes, I am, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Um, then I think we will, um, under new business, um, we will just um, have that opportunity if it doesn't come up during any of our other agenda items, just so that we can answer some of the questions that are out there. Thank you. Okay, so moving on to um, delegations, our first one from MNP Chartered Accountants. Um, we have uh, Corey and Louise in attendance to via Zoom um, to provide information on the city's audit. Thank you, Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. All right, great. Um, and I am going to share screen for our presentation. So hopefully this works. Okay, so I've got the first slide of my presentation up, but I do on Zoom, I do lose the ability to see everybody. So um, what I found is the, um, Best way to kind of go through this is if we could hold some questions till the end, that would be fantastic. Uh, I just won't be able to see if there are questions coming up during the middle. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor, and to the council for having me here today um, to talk about your financial statements. And uh, I look back at the, the financial results for 2019. So I'm going to take you through a quick presentation here of some highlights on the financials, talk about our audit uh, and our audit results and then end with a little bit of financial analysis. Starting off, just a reminder that what you're seeing here in the financial statements um, that are presented today is what we call a consolidated basis. So that's your operating funds, capital activities, and the reserve funds. Oftentimes throughout the year, you're getting reports from staff that might focus on uh, just one of those areas, but this is everything all, all put together. The first uh, page in your um, statement of financial position, uh, in your financial statements, so what we used to call the balance sheet, uh, is a snapshot of what's in the accounts at the end of December 2019. So you can see there the cash and investments has increased almost 2 million to 38.5. Uh, the total financial assets is at $46.7 million. So that's the cash plus accounts receivable and, and the more liquid assets that you can uh, utilize. You'll see there the new short-term debt of 4.4 million. Um, so when I start talking about the capital asset projects, that'll, uh, you'll see why there's some uh, new debt there. That was changed over in May to a, a long-term debenture debt with, uh, with MFA. So just a timing thing of uh, short-term debt at the end of December. Long-term debt being paid down on schedule down to 9.8. So if we add the, the two debt line items there uh, and the accounts payable and regular liabilities, uh, you get a total liability figure of 28 million. If I subtract that off the 46 of financial assets, we get what we call the net financial asset position 
uh, of $18.7 million. So a positive net financial asset position, not a net debt position, um, which is a good thing for the city to be in. Then the, the biggest number on the balance sheet is the physical assets, the road, water, sewer, buildings, equipment, everything you can touch. Um, and that's on the books at 122.4 million. You can see a significant increase year over year, about a, a $15 million increase. So there's around $18 million in, in capital projects throughout 2019. Uh, and then we, there's some depreciation um, to, that brings it down to about a, a $15 million increase. The two biggest ones um, that are were in progress at year end being the um, SOMAS estuary project and the sewage treatment upgrades. So uh, I am sure you've had many reports on those over the last little while, but that's what you can see there in the financials. And then the last number, what we call the accumulated surplus of uh, just shy of $142 million. I'll get into what's in that number in a, in a future slide, but you can see that most of that value is in this physical assets of 122 million. The next slide is the income statement or the statement of operations. So starting with revenues, you can see an $11 million increase in revenues. Um, most of that being grant money coming in for the capital projects, which is kind of what we would expect to see with a, with a big capital year. Uh, there is also uh, 1.5 million of income uh, being recorded from the Alberni Valley Community Forest. On the expenses side, a uh, $2.4 million increase year over year really spread in, the, in several different areas, but the three main uh, largest increases were in uh, general government and administration, protective services, and in recreation and culture. So those are, are often areas where there's a lot of wage costs, so not unexpected to see those increases in, in that area. And then the annual surplus on an accounting basis of just shy of 12 million, so an $8.8 .8 million increase from what you saw in 2018. Because that's an accounting surplus, uh, it's not necessarily how you think about your financials when you're doing budget and, and looking at your, your results uh, in mid-year and things like that. So this, the statement of cash flows is a little bit of a better look at what's going on throughout the year and a little bit closer to how you think during budget process. So operations uh, at the city brought in $16.8 million of uh, that's you know grant funding, um, user fees, taxes, the capital projects, as I mentioned, again, just over $19 million of capital, so a large, large year for, for capital projects. Uh, $2.3 million uh, transferred out of investments and things to mostly to pay for capital projects. Uh, and then $4 million net on the financing. So $4.4 million uh, of that new short-term debt. And then uh, the, the $250,000 that's being paid down on a regular basis on the long-term debt. So at the end of the year, there was a net cash inflow um, for the city of $4.1 million. I promised I'd get into the accumulated surplus in the $141.9 million. So you can see there, the largest number is $108 million in the physical assets. So that's the value of the assets on the books minus the debt that's associated with them. There's $25 million set aside in reserves and there was some increases there. So some more money put aside for future projects uh, and the capital fund uh, of 27.6, very consistent year over year. As well, the operating fund had a very consistent results here. There's a small, um, that's actually an improvement to the deficit position to go from 19.5 to 19.2. So that's where you get from your uh, just shy of 130 million to just shy of 142 million in your accumulated surplus account uh, balance. Shifting gears a little bit away from the financials, just a, little, a few quick things about the audit. Um, you know, our first year uh, coming in and working with the city, uh, I just wanna um, thank your, your team there. Um, thank Andrew and Rosalind for all the support um, helping us uh, get the audit done. We're happy to be able to provide uh, what we call an unqualified opinion. So that is a clean audit opinion. Um, we are satisfied that your financial statements are not materially misstated and they are prepared in accordance with the correct uh, government reporting framework. So we're ready to sign our report. The last step in all of that is uh, council approval of financials here today. And all those minor outstanding matters were actually wrapped up last Friday, just making sure we had some of our last few bits of paperwork. So that's, uh, we're in good shape um, for signing off today. Our audit findings report, which this is also a summary of, 
just talks a little bit about what does an auditor do? What are our responsibilities? So we do several things. First of all, we look at the controls in place at the city to give ourselves some comfort that you have accurate financial reporting, that the numbers you see are, are being prepared properly. Uh, we are looking at how the controls are designed and uh, implemented to make sure you're safeguarding assets and, and reporting accurately, but we don't specifically test the effectiveness of those controls. So my audit report is telling you that the financial statements are accurate. It's not saying anything specifically about the controls and whether they're working properly. I think they're designed effectively, but I haven't specifically tested if they're working properly. We sample transactions throughout the year to form our audit opinion. We don't look at every transaction. It's uh, not cost effective to do that. So we sample and, and get a good sense of uh, the transactions throughout the year. Uh, reporting about we didn't find any irregularities, unusual transactions, um, no uh, evidence of fraud or, or illegal things. Uh, we're not specifically fraud investigators when we're doing a financial statement audit, but if something came to our attention, we would be required to bring it to your attention as counsel. Uh, again, another thank you to staff, uh, not just in the finance firm, but, but across, the, uh, across the city, because we are talking to uh, lots of different departments. Um, an unusual year this year, definitely with COVID, we did a lot of our work remotely. And, uh, and that was also another wrinkle to add on. So uh, I really do want to thank staff. Uh, we'll confirm that we are independent of the city. Uh, we did one other uh, piece of work with the city and that was uh, uh, an assistance with preparing the financial statements. Um, but that doesn't put us offside of being your auditor. We are still able to maintain our independence. Uh, we had a separate, separate uh, MMP team member uh, to do that piece of work. And then I'll, I'll wrap off with um, some financial analysis. So we started off looking at a snapshot of 2019 and that one year in time. We like to look at the last five years um, and look at some trends and some ratios and kind of give you a sense of where the city's moving. Um, so we start by looking at a, a sustainability ratio and we compare the total financial assets to, have to the liabilities. The key in this one is that, that magic number of one. If you're above one, you've got funds available for future projects. If this ratio dips below one, it means you're taxing or raising um, user fees uh, in the future to pay for the past. So uh, the good number here for the city is that it's been fluctuating between uh, about 1.6 and 2.1, and it's currently about 1.67. So it is a positive financial asset position there. Um, and it hasn't dipped below that, that magic number of one. Then we look at flexibility. So here we're looking at the rough age of your capital assets to see, you know, if this aging starts to get a lot lower, um, that means you're gonna have a lot more infrastructure demands. Uh, you're gonna have a lot more projects that need to be done uh, and that, that does tie up uh, cash flow. So this is the rough age uh, of the assets, the carrying value on the books compared to the original cost. Uh, it's about 53% and it's been fluctuating between 51 and 53. There's been some significant capital projects, as I mentioned this year, so it's, it's uh, climbing a little bit, um, which is good. Um, and, but that ratio is something you want to keep an eye on. That's not a full you know, um, asset management model. That's just a very rough number coming off the financial statements. Full asset management, would want you would want to be getting into condition assessments and timing of replacement and things like that. And then the last area we look at is what we call vulnerability. So where you're looking at other sources of funding, the government transfers, federal government money, things like that, um, and seeing how, how reliant you might be on that. This one's been fluctuating a lot um, between about 7.85 and 23.15. So last year, I did mention there's about $11 million of grant funding last year. So you're at 23.15%. We expect to see this um, number high in years where there are large capital projects that, that get federal funding. We also do expect that as we move into a, you know, when we get to a COVID recovery period, we expect that there will be some federal money coming through on the infrastructure side. So this is a ratio that might be high for a while as there is money being put into both economic recovery, infrastructure projects, housing projects, things that, they're, uh, that they have earmarked as ways to kind of um, help the economy and, and help the communities. So thank you for taking the time to uh, listen to my presentation. Uh, I will stop the sharing and I would be happy to answer any questions uh, that the council may have. Thank you, uh, Councillor Solda first. Yeah, I have a question about the airport debt. 
am I missing it? I don't see it in there because um, in, in our financials, is it? That would be held by the regional district. So we wouldn't show it? But wouldn't that be our debt, Madam Mayor? Still, we have to pay that back. So there is there a line item that we pay to the regional district for that? Probably be just in our general payment, but um, Andrew, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, certainly, uh, Madam Mayor. Uh, so with, with the Alberta Claypot Regional District, uh, the, the tax requisition that we see from the ACRD every year, that uh, airport debt is within that line item in our financial plan. So that's so, where we need that. And, and the, the debt is recognized on their uh, financial statements every year when they have their. So this year's borrowing wouldn't be reflected right now at all till next year, right? Madam Mayor, um, the, the debt that we have, we had two components within our financial statements and that included the the short-term debt that we have for the lagoon project and and, and the other long-term debt we already had locked in over the years so so what i'm referring to is the, at the acrd level when we get the invoice from the acrd is it reflected in that invoice like is it broken down i can't remember so maybe you could refresh me madam mayor within the financial plan that the acrd provides they provide a a a summary of all the the tax requisition for the city based on on the on the participation that we have um so madam mayor um just to get a handle on that so our debt for airport is not reflected in this statement but do we have a total for that debt I think that would be a question for the regional district um, because it is regional district debt. So um, you know, to single out the airport, there's other items that we may have debt for at the regional district as well, but um, this is a financial picture of the city. So the requisition that we pay to them every year, how it's broken down would not be reflected in our financial statements. Okay, then I misunderstood because I always thought if we borrowed money, even though it's through the regional district, it's part of our debt too. So, okay, fair enough. I will wait. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, other questions from council? Councillor Corbeil. There we go, we're unmuted. Just a question regarding the um, uh, RCMP contract surplus. It, it didn't change from 2018 to 2019. It was slightly over a uh, million dollars. And I, I'm pretty sure there was still a surplus from what we budgeted. Where does that money end up going? And I don't know if Corey could answer that or not. Thank you, Councillor. I will defer to staff. Uh, they have a better idea of the what's in the reserves and where that money would be. It's on page 33. Yeah, and we do have a report on this um, later in the agenda as well. But Andrew, if you want to comment. Yeah, Madam Mayor, so at, at year end, at December 31st, the transfer of the uh, million dollars that, that was uh, in surplus for 2018, 2019, haven't been transferred over yet. It currently sits in general in the general surplus, and we'll move that over into the RCMP surplus uh, uh, as soon as we can to uh, get that completed so that 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 reserve is topped up to the two million dollars that council has approved thank you andrew thank you other questions from council okay seeing none uh let me just get back to my agenda here um would somebody like to move the motion that's written councillor haggard I'd like to move that the auditor's report and the 2019 audited financial statements be received and approved as presented. Second. Second, and any further comments? Okay, seeing none, all in favor. Any opposed, none opposed, carried. Okay, um, Corey, thank you so much for uh, to your group for their work on this. It's always nice to have you know, a new auditor, which brings a new set of eyes. And um, it's nice to see things presented in a different way as well, because every time you see them in a different way, um, you learn a little bit more. So thanks so much for the presentation and for your time. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Bye-bye.
Okay, moving on to our next item from our acting director of engineering, we have the liquid waste management plan submission approval. Do we have Ken on? Madam Mayor, uh, Mr. Watson's um, away on vacation today, but we have Tom Robinson, who's um, the lead um, project manager for associate engineering. And I believe Tom's gonna join us and make a presentation. Thank you. There's also a reporting on page 49 from uh, Mr. Watson. Perfect. Thank you, can everyone hear me? Yes. Very good, uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Uh, so, um, uh, if I understand correctly, this afternoon is for the purpose of uh, receiving Council's authorization for staff uh, to submit the Stage 2-3 Liquid Waste Management Plan that's been prepared by Associated Engineering and submit that to the Minister of Environment for review and approval, after which time you would have an approved Liquid Waste Management Plan. I'll provide a very short summary of what has brought us to this point. Um, and obviously the council is aware that uh, this uh, process has been going on for some time. The liquid waste management planning process was initiated in 2001 uh, and uh, was uh, worked on gradually year by year, but uh, a big push uh, on that plan was initiated in 2013 in response to changes in uh, regulations that required um, urgency uh, and, and plans to move ahead. So for 2013 to 2017, the city uh, worked very hard on the liquid waste management plan. It was during that time, at the beginning of that time, that the city acquired the Catalyst uh, Lagoon. Uh, there were uh, about nine or 10 wastewater advisory committee meetings. And also as a part of that, there was um, approximately seven meetings with the Sashat First Nation and uh, two or three also with the, the Chasit First Nation. Uh, and progress was uh, moving ahead very well with that. The plan um, was very instrumental in determining the design of the infrastructure, uh, most notably um, in establishing the best location for the reintroduction of the treated wastewater back into the natural environment. Uh, and the local First Nations uh, had a significant impact uh, that improved the project, I think, for the environment in this respect. And a lot of work went into locating uh, that final location uh, um, that would uh, minimize whatever impact uh, the discharge would have and uh, significantly improve the uh, existing situation. In 2017, the uh, city set aside the MWR, uh, the liquid waste management process uh, for a time because it was the province's preference uh, that uh, the city be uh, ultimately governed under the wastewater management regulation and that they would have an MWR registration process. And so that became the focus of the effort of that time. However, in March, April of this year, uh, the city reactivated uh, to complete the LWMP process and prepare the report that you have in front of you uh, for submission and ultimately uh, for the uh, minister's uh, approval. Uh, the, LWMV, the LWMV process is a more holistic process uh, and uh, it uh, provides some benefits to the city in terms of planning um, and in your interactions with First Nations and certain other governmental organizations. And uh, in that some of those interactions are happening now, especially with local First Nations, uh, it's a, a benefit to the city uh, to be able to articulate their commitments with respect to wastewater going forward. And, um, and support those discussions uh, within the LWMP framework. If and when the MW, the, the minister approves the plan, the city will actually have uh, both an MWR registration, which will be the legal discharge that you use uh, and conform to and, and do your reporting under. And you would also have an approved liquid waste management plan. And, um, and that's probably, uh, it's the best approach for the city, um, owing to the fact that uh, the environment uh, in your area uh, is quite complex. And uh, one of the attributes of a liquid waste management plan is that you have a plan monitoring committee, which is a group of stakeholders 
that would be uh, monitoring the operations of the wastewater treatment plant and also um, operating the city's commitment and progress made on executing uh, commitments made for uh, addressing such issues as uh, uh, separating sewers and reducing overflows. Um, so I think that's a, a reasonably good summary of how we've got to this point. And if you have any questions, I'd be pleased to respond. Thank you. Are there questions from council? Councilor Corbeil. Yeah, the report talks about um, uh, reusing biosolids, continue to reuse biosolids. And um, I, I don't know what we're doing now, but uh, uh, I know uh, Victoria, who have finally got a uh, treatment plant, shipped biosolids all the way over to a cement plant in Vancouver. And it would seem to me with the paper mill just across the river that there might be a huge opportunity for us. Uh, Tom, maybe you could comment on that. Yeah, that's a very big topic. Uh, I'll try and give you a 30, 30 seconder. Um, lagoon based systems um, accumulate biosolids on the bottom of the lagoon. And what's different about lagoon based systems to what you have in Victoria and other uh, locations is that those are typically removed, uh, let's say, every five to 10 years, plus or minus. Um, at that stage, uh, they're, they're removed. There's a, an enormous quantity of them. Uh, they need to be dewatered. And, um, and disposed of, but rather than disposing of them as, uh, as, as purely as waste, the organic um, content does make it suitable as um, uh, an amendment to a compost system or a soil amendment. And so that's the option that we would be looking at for Port Alberni, it's the only suitable option really. Um, just touching briefly on a situation like Victoria, uh, who, as you know, didn't get there overnight, um, uh, eventually have decided to uh, digest their biosolids, uh, uh, produce biogas, which has a value. And then the residual caloric value uh, that's, that's remaining, if it's dried, uh, can be used uh, in, um, in, 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 in various operations that can require and benefit from that heat. And that's what they're doing. But the level of investment that they're doing um, to both uh, digest the biosolids and produce biogas first, and then ultimately produce a product that's uh, suitable for combustion is significant. Um, Associated Engineering is actually involved in that uh, facility. We were the designers of that facility, so we know it very well. Thank you. Other questions from Council? Councilor Solda. Yeah, just a quick question. We've seen the costs escalate for not um, because not of our fault, but because Canada um, Health Canada keeps changing the rules here. Do you foresee that ever ha happening in the future? And more costs added to this whole picture because it's growing and growing. So, and we do need the system. So do you see that in the future? Through the chair, um, we can't predict the future. I know you don't expect I know. to, um, but <laughs> yeah. I think I think uh, in fairness to your question, um, it's my view that we will see um, additional regulations, um, you know, beyond the ten-year horizon, to deal with two areas uh, that remain unaddressed in regulations, and they're really unaddressed because they are they're not on the leading edge, they're on the bleeding edge of where wastewater treatment um, uh, is uh, on a global scale. Uh, obviously, you will have all heard about microplastics and plastics in the ocean. Uh, microplastics <clears throat> come from uh, many different sources. And, and, and in fact, that's, uh, you know, there's a lot of effort to actually go on and understand where they're coming. But in municipal wastewater, they come from um, fibers, mostly washing uh, of uh, synthetic fibers in our clothes. And uh, those are not uh, well um, captured and removed by municipal wastewater treatment systems of any kind. Uh, 
uh, and uh, to do so would require uh, in all likelihood some sort of uh, filtration processes. Um, so that might be one area where we would see some uh, changes. And another would be in the area of um, pharmaceuticals and uh, hormone products uh, that um, make it, again, make it through uh, wastewater treatment systems because they are fairly resistant to uh, biological uh, uh, degradation uh, by biological processes. Um, but those won't be, uh, th those, those will take years uh, to come, uh, I would think. And, uh, and they'll have to come with technologies that help to deal with those. Um, so I think, I think that's probably the, the most comfort and the least comfort that I could give you with respect to your question. Thank you very much. Councillor Washington. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Tom, do you have a, a rough estimate how, how often we're, with this new system we're going to have to remove the biosolids from mm. the lagoon? Is there like five years, 10 years every week or mm. any kind of estimation? Right. Well, um, without the benefit of running a few numbers, I would say on average, approximately every 10 years. Um, it's a fairly uh, forgivable process. Uh, it can be deferred um, if, if need be for a few years. It can be accelerated if, uh, if the opportunity is there to do so. But I think for planning purposes, I, I would use 10 years. Great. Thank you. Other questions from council? Councillor Paulson. I don't really have a question. It's more of a comment. And uh, thank you so much for uh, pulling this together. And we're in the home stretch on this project, which I think is really exciting. And <laughs> we're coming into this century with regards to technology and stuff. And when this comes online, the difference uh, is going to be marked and substantial from our old system with regards to being far more friendly and far more advanced. Um, and just thank you for uh, all you've done over the years. And uh, uh, we're excited to get this project online here pretty quick. If I could just comment briefly to that. Um, you know, no one would describe uh, the design um, as a high tech design. Um, but I will say that uh, this is probably one of the most challenging projects that I've worked with. And it really comes down to the very complex uh, interaction that you have with a, uh, a major industry and an, and an, an industrial legacy, uh, the inlet, the river with it's important with fisheries and, and your local First Nations. Uh, it, it has, uh, it's tested us on many occasions. And, but I am also very uh, uh, happy uh, with the outcome. And I feel that, um, especially with respect to the fishery and, and what at times is a very delicate balance in the late summer, uh, that the design that we have with the help of the First Nations, I, I should credit them, has I think done a, a good job to, to give the tools to manage that resource as best it, it can be managed at least from a wastewater perspective. Thank you. And on that, um, Tim, I, I'm curious just about, I know we've worked, you know, extensively with Sashad and Hupachesset on this over the years, as well as recently. Is there, um, you know, do they have their own process um, to submit their feedback separate from, our, from us submitting this plan? Um, or if you could just provide a bit more background on, on kind of next steps there. Um, Madam Mayor, as Tom has uh, mentioned, um, both uh, Hupetchesit and, and Sashad have been involved in the process um, through a number of years. Um, and Tom also mentioned that the landscape has shifted while this project's been underway. Um, the landscape has also shifted in terms of consultation with First Nations. And we've seen at the provincial level um, consultation taking a much higher profile and importance. And um, that, I think, coupled with our restart or reactivation of the liquid waste management plan um, has caused us to re-engage with both nations um, on a number of fronts. So we have been um, working, engaging uh, 
who purchase it and it's a shot on as, as we're required to um, as part of the liquid waste management plan um, stage two three and at the same time the, the provincial government has engaged both nations um, on their own, uh, satisfying their own obligation to consult with first nations so um, both first nations have been engaged at, in at least two streams and um, I think having quite a bit of uh, workload thrust upon them to have to respond to these engagements and uh, beyond that, Madam Mayor, I couldn't really speak for um, First Nation needs or, or concerns. Thank you. I think it's just good to have, you know, a bit of background of, of the work that we have done um, with Sashat and Hupachasset, recognizing how important this area is um, to all of us, but certainly to them for fisheries as well. Madam Mayor, can I, can I also just echo Tom's other comment around um, how the project and our, our, our response to managing and our uh, liquid waste is actually um, considerably improved by the engagement that we've had with the multiple stakeholders, but, but none um, more important than, than First Nations. And in fact, we've we found a way to coexist, we think, very well with the environment, especially with fish and with fishers um, as, we, as we develop the outflow, outfall. Um, we uh, incorporated designs that would that would not conflict with fishing. So I'm quite pleased with the work that we've done and, and uh, really thankful for input from both Hupetchasit uh, and Sashat. Wonderful, thank you very much. Okay, uh, we do have a motion. Would somebody like to um, read the motion that is presented there for us to submit this? Madam Mayor, I'd like to move that the Council direct staff to advance the Stage 2-3 Liquid Waste Management Plan to the BC Ministry of Environment and Climate Change Strategy as our application for approval of Port Alberti Stage 2-3 Liquid Waste Management Plan. I'll second, second, second Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. And moved and seconded. Any further comments? Seeing none, all in favour. None opposed, carried. Thank you very much um, for your work on this, Tom. And moving on to item three, Alberni Valley Bulldogs. Um, we have David Michaud, president of the Alberni Valley Bulldogs in attendance via Zoom to present um, the proposal for the multiplex digital screen. Welcome, David. Hi guys, sorry, bear with me one second. Okay, everyone hear me? Yeah. Perfect. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, everyone can see? Perfect. Okay, thanks Madam Mayor and Council for giving me the opportunity to uh, speak with you guys today. I, I guess uh, I, I was sort of reflecting back, talking with a, a few people. It's really my first opportunity to speak with Council since uh, becoming president of the Bulldogs a, a year ago. So appreciative of the opportunity to sort of fill you guys in on uh, uh, life as a bulldog right now, it's uh, certainly a little interesting and challenging uh, as it is for a lot of people in the business sector. Um, but uh, in regards to the uh, proposal for a, a LED screen to be added at the multiplex, I, I thought it would certainly be helpful for you to maybe understand a little bit of our motives behind it uh, and how we think it would uh, certainly help the city and the multiplex moving forward. So our discussion today, I just want to touch on our, our current ownership structure, why local was important to that group, uh, why Port Alberni, uh, what happened last year, and then our new marketing approach. So the current ownership structure of the Bulldogs looks like this. Uh, Key Corp Sports and Entertainment purchased the majority share of the Bulldogs back on July 18th, 2019. So we just celebrated our, our first year anniversary. Uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Ron Coutre, who's a Victoria businessman but owns a home on the lake as a part of our group. Uh, and then of course the incumbent owners, the Port Alberni Junior Hockey Society, 
uh, C Brother Holdings with Dennis C and his uh, his group, and then uh, McLean Weber Holdings, which is uh, Stephanie Weber and, and Tim McLean, make up our current ownership group. For our group with Key Corp, uh, really we felt having local partners was the only way we wanted to do a deal in a town that wasn't ours in, in Victoria. Uh, and uh, you know, having that ownership group together really solidified our interest in, in getting a deal done. So for those of you who don't know a history with me, I've been involved in the BCHL for a number of years. I was in Penticton prior uh, and why Port Alberni was certainly exciting to me uh, was there's always been a longstanding belief that the, the Bulldogs were sort of just on that second tier of teams in the BCHL uh, and that with perhaps the right structure, they could sort of vault into that upper echelon of teams. Um, you know, the community support has always been tremendous. The corporate support has been great. Uh, really, it just became more and more apparent that as an ownership group, we just needed to do a better job of giving the fans a reason to, to come out and support the team. So to give you an idea of what happened last year in our first year, obviously, uh, the ammonia leak in November had a, a real terrible effect on our, our annual budget. Uh, it affected uh, almost 20% of our home schedule games either had to be relocated to, uh, to other communities. We played one game at Oceanside and one game in Campbell River. We're gracious hosts, but it certainly, uh, certainly wasn't the home kind of friendly confines of the multiplex, uh, as well as um, games had to be rescheduled. Basically we went from Friday, Saturday night games to Tuesday, Wednesdays and Thursday night games. Um, and then one thing else I wanted to explain in regards to that scenario, all opposition teams that were affected by that, um, that were forced to come back to Port Alberni, we were on the hook financially to pay for their travel, meals, hotels, to come back and, and play those games. So our, our total setback from November alone was about $30,000. Uh, and then of course, COVID-19 happened in March. Uh, we lost a couple of our, our development camps and the revenue that went with it. And now as a little cherry on top, the 2021 season has been postponed uh, until December 1st. Uh, I sit on the BCHL Board of Governors uh, representing the Bulldogs. I also sit on our return to play committee. Uh, and, you know, admittedly, December 1st, uh, you know, we're hopeful, but it's it could be ambitious with the way things are going. Um, so to sum it all up, in our, our first year operating in the club, we suffered uh, over a six-figure loss during the 1920 season. I thought it was important as well, you know, to note that one of the first things our ownership group did uh, was extend our lease through 2024. Um, it was important for us that not only council, but our fan base and our corporate partners knew that we were committed to keeping the Bulldogs in Port Alberni uh, and uh, no better way in our mind to, to achieve that than extending the lease for, uh, for another four seasons. So I guess looking towards the future, one of the things that's been, you know, more and more prevalent over the years is the development of, of hockey and junior hockey, for that matter, being an entertainment business, not just a hockey business. You know, it's not enough anymore to say, hey, Nanaimo's coming to town, let's open the doors and turn on the lights and expect a full building anymore. The reality is, is we feel we really are competing for entertainment dollars, not just sports fans. Uh, and so we need to uh, we need to convince people in Port Alberni that we're we're a great night out. It's not just about coming to a hockey game; it's about coming and, and having a good time and being entertained. So the multiplex built in 2001. There's really been limited capital upgrades into the facility since uh, since construction was completed. Uh, we were asked, "What do we feel is needed, perhaps, to to move the building in the right direction?" Uh, it starts. Uh, for me with the, the LED digital wall, uh, some food and beverage upgrades. Uh, I think anyone who's been to a game knows those pinch points during the intermission uh, becomes tough to, to get a beverage or, or some food. Um, increased social areas we're finding in sports now, it's, it's less about maybe sitting in your seat for the entire game. People like to congregate in areas and, and have a social evening. Uh, lighting upgrades, which uh, are currently being explored, and, and we've been asked to contribute fiscally to uh, some of that, and, and we're happy to do so. And then finally, some sound system upgrades. 
So the addition of an LED digital wall would instantly allow the Bulldogs to compete with the top tier facilities in the BCHL. And I wanted to put together a little bit of a, a rendering uh, in the back. You can see what it would sort of look like, where it would be positioned on the end wall. Um, the last time you heard about this, uh, you know, a week or two weeks ago, I believe, uh, there, there wasn't a lot of, uh, you know, uh, indication on what this might look like or where it might go. So I felt this rendering might give uh, Mayor and Council an opportunity to sort of see what the vision for it was. So the new marketing approach. So really the biggest thing about adding the screen for the Bulldogs, obviously it allows for a complete change in the in-game presentation. Now we can have things like kiss cams and noise meters and instant replays, which are gonna greatly enhance uh, the fan experience. Uh, also, obviously, key for us is revenue generation uh, from custom ads to sponsored content. The wall would be a valuable asset to our Bulldogs marketing inventory. Uh, certainly, other users would benefit from the, the screen being in the multiplex as well. Minor hockey, lacrosse, figure skating, the graduation would all benefit. And then I think something really important to touch on is, is event hosting ability. I mean, we get asked often with the Bulldogs, well, you know, why don't we bid to host things and, and uh, the LED wall would go a long way. I got to admit, like right now, if you were to read any Hockey Canada bid documents, it sort of starts and stops with an LED screen or, or video capabilities in the building. Um, so hosting the 2009 World Junior A Championships was, was really well received in Port Alberni. Uh, the building wouldn't be considered at this point. And then I think taking it even a step further, whether the Bulldogs had any availability to help in this is certainly up to council, um, you know, but just what else could the building be used for? Could there be larger conventions? Could there be trade shows, things of that nature, which certainly would be buoyed by the, uh, the addition of uh, the video capabilities. So if you look around our league, I, I threw a couple of examples up just to sort of see, because it's basically apples to apples, what we're talking about with facilities who have end wall screens. Uh, so as it stands right now, 11 of our 18 buildings have it. Uh, Coquitlam is currently in the, uh, the, per the process of purchasing where they'd be the 12th and hopefully, uh, you know, based on your decision, we could be the 13th team. Um, maybe more importantly, Nanaimo doesn't have it. So that would be a nice, a nice win over the Clippers in, in that regard. So the proposal, we wanted to make it as easy as possible for um, council to understand sort of how this would, would work or how we view it being able to work. Uh, LED wall would be an asset owned by the city. Bulldogs will use increased revenue to compensate you for that capital investment to pay it back. Once capital investment is paid back, you're now in a positive situation by charging other user groups the ability to use the screen. Summary, despite a turbulent first year, we're committed to ensuring the long-term viability of the Bulldogs in Port Alberni, led by head coach and GM Joe Martin. We believe we have a roster that's capable of competing this season. Uh, and quite frankly, we want to work with you guys on initiatives that help bring the dog pound back to the glory days is, is a really intimidating building. Teams hated coming to Port Alberni, and we want to get it back to that way. Uh, An LED wall certainly is a, is a part of our long-term ability to succeed in town. Thank you very much. You, okay, guys. questions from Council. Councillor Poon and then Councillor Solda. Thank you. I'm just wondering, uh, with regards to this digital wall, are there any other alternatives that could be considered, like a projector screen or something like that, something that is less costly? Yeah, I don't believe so. I mean, I, I think you get what you pay for ultimately. Um, you know, the, the nice part about an investment like this is, uh, you know, the lifetime of the machine, um, you know, I mean, if this thing was turned on 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, it would last well over a decade. So, I mean, the reality is this, this should, you know, theoretically uh, be a, a once in a lifetime purchase. Um, so I think really the, uh, you know, the technical advancements with where they're at with LED screens now, the fact that it would have full uh, 4K and HD replays and all the rest of it, um, you know, while the capital cost is, is maybe a little higher than some alternatives, uh, I think the product that you're ultimately going to get for allows us to recoup any money way faster through ad sales and, and sponsorship initiatives. Thank you. Councillor Solda and then Councillor Corbell. Yeah. Um, one is for the CAO regarding the, um, the ammonia leak. Does our insurance kick in at all to help 
um, with what happened there? That's one question. Madam Mayor, through you to Councillor Solda, um, I, I would ask uh, Director Thorpe to speak about the insurance. She's been dealing with it directly, but I can tell you that um, the city's insurance will not uh, recover the losses that that um, Dave has described to you here. So the, the Bulldogs are not going to be covered by the city's insurance. But okay. we'll have more information to add. Thank you. Uh, yes, Madam Mayor, that's uh, CAO flies correct that uh, we wouldn't be in a, a situation where insurance would cover the losses of the Bulldogs with the chiller interruption in November. Okay, and the other thing is with COVID coming, there were so many organizations, arts included, were all affected by this. So by COVID, it's just what happened. And I'm just kind of curious to know from the owner if um, he was able to apply for the $500 million uh, COVID funding for sports. Does that include you in that picture? Uh, initially, it does not, Councillor. We uh, have been leaving that to the league level. Our, uh, our executive, uh, of which I sit on, as well as Commissioner Chris Hebb and our uh, Assistant Director Stephen Cocker have been working closely with the, uh, the provincial government. Uh, they've had uh, numerous meetings with Minister Bear and the Ministry of Sport, uh, Premier Horgan as well. Uh, to this point, we've received no indication that the BCHL is going to receive any financial help, uh, despite what we felt was a fairly uh, compelling argument to the money that we inject into 17 communities around the province. Uh, so it's, it's unfortunate, but uh, we seem to be falling through a little bit of a crack between the fact that we're not quite obviously professional sports and we're not true minor sports or, or you know, amateur, I guess, as well. So uh, long-winded answer is it doesn't look like anything at this point, but we're still fighting the good fight. Okay, so to add to that, um, a lot of the, uh, businesses, the arts included, if they haven't made what they made in the last couple of years, mm -hmm. they can get a top up from the government to help with yep. that. Um, would that. Would you fall into that category too? We do. Because if your sales are down. Yeah, no question. Yeah, no, no. Our, our, our group has taken advantage of uh, every government subsidy that's been available to us, including the, the $40,000 loan. Uh, obviously, it's a loan, but it certainly helped cash flow to, to get us through the summer. Uh, you know, we've tried to minimize our, our burn rate as much as possible. Um, but the reality is we haven't had, you know, really a, a penny come in since March. Um, and it's, it's hard to look a sponsor in the eye right now and say, you should give me a check for three or four thousand uh, dollars and we're going to hope that we play a season so we haven't been really going to any sponsors that are are connected to the to the gameplay at all uh we've gotten creative and worked with some partners uh save on food uh, our head coach and general manager joel martin basically from mid-march until the summer delivered groceries every tuesday and thursday uh, to, to fans and seniors in the community. And, and so they stepped up and did a partnership with us sort of outside of the games, but, you know, revenue has been, uh, been, been definitely challenging. That's for sure. And understanding the bigger picture in our community that's happening with every other business in our community, not knocking, yep. putting yours to a different, it's just, you're clumped into my picture here. And, yep. um, a lot of businesses and societies are really taking a, a hit and surprisingly, even or um, events that happen year to year, they have taken a big hit. Um, I know that a lot of them are doing going ahead with their ticket uh, raffles and stuff like that. They're still moving ahead, same as like the P and E organization. Um, I I understand the screen. I think it's great, and I think it's it would be an asset to our community. But at this time with COVID, you're going to have to really convince me on that. There's so much more that's needed in this community community at this moment so right. I'm not sure where I'm at yeah I think it's worth pointing out that I'm not asking for the city for anything yeah. other than help with the capital cost and and the Bulldogs uh business plan would okay. be to take to take those revenue sales pay you back and whatever you want to do with the screen outside of Bulldogs games okay. is entirely is entirely up to you so I, I think it's important to know we're not trying to jump the queue or, or get in front of anybody uh as far as a, a you know, perceived handout goes. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we feel that this is a tremendous opportunity for the city to be engaged in future events uh, and future opportunities for the multiplex that could generate, quite frankly, far more for the community than any initial capital cost would be, which is going to get paid back. In. And, and I'm curious to see what's going to happen without our gaming um, 
money that we normally get because there's been no gaming in our community. So we're down there. So all these uh, organizations, I don't know, it'll be interesting when we start sitting down and talking about that because there's no money for that sector. So anyways, that's my two cents. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Corbeil, and then Councillor Washington, and then Councillor Paulson. David, do you know the uh, cost of the uh, walls and some of the other uh, arenas that you uh, mentioned? Uh, just very brief conversations. I haven't asked for any backup or documentation, but they all sort of seem to range between the 150 to, to 180 mark, including the replay systems. And, uh, you know, I think originally count or uh, uh, Willa Thorpe had put a number of about 200,000 on it. I think that included some sort of, uh, um, you know, uh, contingency in case something went wrong and included the, the full installation, a little bit of engineering work that would have to be done and, and then moving a couple of the existing backlit signs to another wall. Uh, so I, I think the number was probably a, a touch high, but we built in a contingency and we certainly rounded up. So I don't know, uh, Willa, if you want to speak to that or uh, yes, Madam Mayor, of course, we, we build in contingencies into any numbers we provide Council. Uh, and also that uh, I'm not aware of the most recent purchase of a similar screen uh, in a facility. So, of course, uh, costs are bound to, bound to go up as we were just discussing with the Lagoon project. So, yes, we always like to quote a little high so that we can be sure to, uh, to arrive under budget. Thank you for that. Councillor Washington. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, just a question to David, if he can answer this. Sure. Um, how tough are these things? Like, is a straight puck going to take our budget all to heck if it, <laughs> it gets hit in the right place at the right time? No. So uh, I, I guess maybe to, to give you a little perspective, uh, we put one in the Q Center in, in Victoria for our lacrosse team, the Victoria Shamrocks. And, uh, and uh, lacrosse balls conveniently uh, go a little higher, perhaps inconveniently go a little higher than pucks. And uh, really the unit is absorbed to take a hit. The, the, the square, you have to picture these things are basically just hundreds of little LED pads basically. And if one pops out, you just literally touch it back into place. But our placement behind the, the net on the end wall where the screen's in place right now anywhere, the mesh behind the net, uh, we feel it'd be really safe in that spot there. It'd be pretty tricky for a puck to, to actually ever hit it. But they're very durable, very easy maintenance as well to pop in and pop out. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Paulson. Thank you, David, for your uh, presentation. And um, uh, I, I really appreciate um, the Bulldogs and um, Director Thorpe sitting down and coming up with a creative, um, as you are saying, and I just want to reiterate, this is not a gift. Uh, this is something that uh, would be installed. Uh, the city would provide upfront funding, but it's payback funding. And um, to some degree, there's no risk. Um, at the end of the day, um, this is exactly what our Parks and Recreation Reserve Fund is for, and it's for uh, capital improvements, if there's a roof that happens to one of our sports facilities or a track that needs to be replaced or those sorts of things. And uh, when, when we instituted that uh, reserve fund back in, uh, I don't know, about 2008, 2007, um, this is exactly what that conversation was about. Um, and the fact that you've come up with a proposal that at the end of the day, a couple of years down the road, we're not really depleting that, that fund. So um, thank you for coming up with an imaginative way. I fully support your um, proposal and uh, hopefully we can move forward. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't really see this as no risk personally. Um, the, there, there is a risk because what if there's not um, sponsors to sell ads, then what? Um, you know, what if the Bulldogs leave? We all, we certainly don't want that to happen. And I understand this is a benefit to the bull, Bulldogs being in our community long term. But I think as a council, we need to make sure we explore all of the options and, and not simply see this as no risk. Because, um, you know, there have been conversations in our community 
year after year about, you know, trying to keep the bulldogs surviving, trying to keep the bulldogs here. And I get that this is an investment to make the bulldogs stronger um, and to make sure they stay in our community long term, which is what we all want. But if something happens and the bulldogs left, then um, we have a $200,000 expense with no revenue coming in. So I, I'm not suggesting that that's a reason to not move forward with this, but I don't think it's fair to summarize this as no risk. Um, I'm curious to hear a bit more information on, um, you know, it, this has been kind of explained as a, you know, loan, it's a city asset or not a loan, but it's a city asset. Bulldogs will pay us back with advertising revenue. Is there, would all of the revenue be for the Bulldogs on this? Or I would imagine all of the revenue during Bulldogs games, and it could be used outside of Bulldogs games, which again would be a benefit, um, you know, to other users of the multiplex. But would you be keeping 20% of the revenue dollars and paying uh, 20 and paying us back 80% or do you have a split determined so that it benefits you and shows a payback schedule? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think preliminary conversations uh, uh, had a sort of an 80, 85, 15, 80, 20 split until the, the unit was paid off. I mean, the reality is we're going to have in-game costs each and every game to run the unit and, and have videos produced and things of that nature. So we felt that a, a fair split would be uh, amicable in the first you know few years where we pay the unit off in order for us to, to you know operate it properly and effectively. Uh, and then uh, once the screen was paid off, uh, it become no different than a, a rink board or any other backlet sign where it's uh, inventory for us to sell during our games and whatever the city wants to use it for outside of Bulldogs games is, is available to you. Thank you. And, and, and just um, to, sorry, sorry, just to touch on your comment as well, Madam Mayor, I mean, I think it's important to remember uh, our ownership group hasn't been involved in any of those discussions. Uh, I'm not here for a lesson in history. I mean, the reality is we uh, invested several hundred thousand dollars in the community less than, well, I guess a little over 12 months ago now. Uh, so uh, uh, we're not going anywhere. We signed a long-term lease to, to hopefully quell any notion of us going anywhere. Uh, our company is in the business of running sports teams. The Torrey Shamrocks have been around 72 years. Uh, you know, this is what we do every day. So while COVID has certainly added some challenges to our business model, uh, we haven't bounced a paycheck to anybody. We don't owe anybody any money uh, and things are still humming along just fine. So we're, we're the reason why the Bulldogs are in town. I think it's important to remember that, that it's, it's been uh, a long time getting to this, uh, you know, I call it almost a private, uh, public private partnership. You know, the work that the board did, um, you know, keeping the Bulldogs in town was, was commendable. And I feel like they've passed that torch to us and now we're able to tighten a few things up and, and make sure this team isn't going anywhere. Thanks, and I appreciate that. And that's what we all wanna see long-term is the team <laughs> here and the team successful. Um, I know this is preliminary still, but do you have an idea of the payback period? Yeah, we, we anticipate that we can generate somewhere in the neighborhood of about $30,000 a year, give or take a few thousand here or there. Like some, you know, if we had to put it on our, at twenty five dollars to $35,000 annually should be a very reasonable target. Okay, so roughly eight years. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, Councillor Paulson and then um, Councillor Sold, I think, had her hand up as well. I'm just sitting here musing and, and I'm just thinking about uh, this conversation is pretty well revolving around the Bulldogs and certainly that's the impetus here. But, um, you know, the benefit to other groups in our community, I think, uh, can't be underestimated. And to be quite honest, in our community, we do not have a facility in Port Alberni where we can gather um, over 500 people under under a roof, and certainly an audiovisual component would be uh, an impetus, in my my view, to attract uh, larger groups or conventions like could be uh, Kinsmen or Lions or whatever, um, and this could be a part of uh, any convention or conference. Just kind of spreading the view around a bit more. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, even for council purposes, um, this could be very valuable if we ever wanted to host um, ABICC or something like that as well. There's, there's, um, you know, there's no argument whatsoever on the benefit to the community um, and to the Bulldogs. I think that certainly is clear to everyone. Um, Councillor Solda and then Councillor Soon. Yeah, just a couple of things. Yeah, there's been a lot of challenges in our community this last year, but I just want to ABICC, we have rented our screens and stuff like that. Any 
Uh, when we had Paul Brandt, the same thing was uh, for the multiplex, we rented um, the screens if when, when we needed it. But what I wanna talk about is the screen, is the life of a screen. You know, is it 10 years? Because we know technology changes as soon as we buy something. And I'm just kind of curious to know what the life of a screen is. So I think as I indicated, the, the, if the unit was on 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, it would last well over 10 years. And, 10 years. Well, if being on 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, council. So the reality is this thing's probably gonna be on five to eight hours a week uh, so it's, it's reasonable to assume that it would last a lifetime. Okay, and um, what about the computer part of it? Like, because we know technology changes. Yeah. Uh, Is that well, included in that? Well, it could be. I mean, I, I think the, you know, the, the important thing to remember as well is, is all we were really hoping for was to get this to an R, RFP process and solicit bids from potential vendors on, on how they view the solution to this problem. Um, and, and so for me, I guess that would be first, the first step is, is putting together a package that indicates what our goals and dreams and desires are, and, and then seeing which firms out there can, can match that at the most cost effective price. I mean, trust me, I, I would love for it to be 120,000 instead of 200 and we'll have it paid back that much faster and, and beyond with, with things. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Poon. Thank you. I support the concept um, and I realize the pandemic won't be around forever, but uh, I think the cost is still a major point of concern and I'm also very much concerned about the payback period. Um, also, I have a question regarding uh, the, the, the performance of the screen and its longevity. Does the temperature of the operating environment affect the longevity of the screen? We're speaking in hypotheticals at this point. We don't know what the screen would be, but these are built for indoor outdoor use. I see. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Councillor Haggard. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Nice to meet you, David, even through Zoom. Uh, I haven't had the pleasure so far yet and welcome to our community. Uh, I think every person on council really supports the Bulldogs in our community. Uh, they do great work, great community outreach. You know, we're very supportive. Um, however, when I did read the proposal in our last council meeting, I was quite excited, but I had in my mind like $20,000. $200,000 is just a huge amount of money for me right now, um, especially when you're in between budgets. What I would like to do is ask if this can be brought back when you do our budget for next year, instead of trying to come up with $200,000 kind of mid-year, and then we can really consider it at that time. I'm just having a lot of difficulty with that at this time. And also, you're not the only business that's struggling right now. A lot of our businesses in our community are struggling. So I'm really wondering if you'd be able to achieve those uh, projected advertising dollars that you're projecting right now. You know, we had an eight month strike and we have businesses down due to COVID. So you may not be able to achieve that for a while. But anyway, this is something I think we could work towards, but maybe now is just not the most appropriate time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a question for our director of finance, um, if he's on and available. And Andrew, I'm not sure if you'll be able to um, answer this um, on the spot or not. But um, what I'm wondering is the Parks and Rec Reserve. There was conversation at our last meeting about um, whether or not that reserve is funded 100% by user fees, or if we contribute, um, you know, just out of general revenue tax dollars to that reserve. Um, is Andrew available to answer that question? Madam Mayor, um, so you did ask that question and I did look it up afterwards and, and it, what the, the revenue is is for that reserve, or it comes from the, the uh, user fees that we, we charge. We take 10% of those user fees and put it into that reserve every year. So. So we don't over and above that contribute taxpayer dollars to the reserve. It's funded fully through user fees. I will confirm that, but I believe so that's that, that 
Okay, wonderful. Thank you. And you know, it's not if there's ever been a contribution. I just, I'm, I'm curious more about regular practice. And um, to me, I do recognize that this, um, you know, I, I fully see the value of it. Um, I really would have a problem with, um, you know, midway through the year spending money on this, um, even out of reserve funds. I think it's easy to look at reserve funds as just extra money, but reserve funds are there um, you know, to fix roofs and um, repair the track when we need to and not necessarily to take on new expenses. Now, um, if this is a reserve that's funded fully through user fees and not through tax dollars, then that does help me a bit get comfortable with this. Um, if it's, you know, through, um, if users are paying for this, then I think it's a more appropriate use potentially to um, use it to enhance the user experience. Um, I'm still not ready you know, today to make the decision to put out the RFP. But, um, and I think our, our council still needs to wait and see what the results of the naming of that um, arena are. I do think that's relevant because it's potentially funds coming in. Um, I know Councillor Paulson disagrees, um, but you know, at the end of the day, money in our reserves is not just money to use. So I'd like to get to a point where we can all be comfortable. Um, and I think we need to not just spur of the moment spend. Um, I think we need to make sure that our entire council is going to be comfortable making this purchase because it is a large purchase. So um, I'm getting there personally. I appreciate the information that's been brought today. Um, for me, it, it helps to have an idea of the payback period of what a potential split of you know, revenue to help the Bulldogs and revenue to pay back. Um, the funds initially put out, it helps to have that information. I'm not quite there yet. I think it will be helpful if we know we have funds coming in from naming, then that might be an easier way to, to allocate some funds. So um, I think Councillor Solda's hand was up. And then if anyone would like to, you know, try to make a motion for direction, we could certainly um, entertain that today. And if not, we can wait. This will automatically come back when we explore the naming rights because we have previously directed that. Councillor Solda. Yeah, Madam Mayor, I agree with everything you've said and reserves are still taxpayers money, no matter what, right? Because that's where we got it. So thank you for your words. Thank you. Any other comments? Councillor Corbeil. Just uh, I guess for David's benefit, uh, the, the naming rights, we will know fairly soon, I think. So this isn't something that we'll have to wait months and months for. Yeah, we're expecting that to come back in August. So, um, you know, from my perspective, it makes sense to talk about this all together. And um, if we may have some funds coming in, I think then it's an opportunity to, um, you know, it, it, it feels a bit more natural to allocate some of those, some funds on the multiplex if there's funds coming in for the multiplex. So. Um, this is not something that we would be waiting, you know, six months to discuss. It will be coming back in the very near future. With that, are there any other questions, comments, or motions to bring forward uh, from councillors? Okay, seeing none. Um, David, I want to thank you for coming today. Um, I know that, um, you know, everybody always, of course, wants a quick yes, and I hope that you can appreciate that. Um, you know, the support that is on our council for the Bulldogs and all that you do do in the community. And, and I hope that you can see that we want to get to a point where we can make this happen. Great. Thank you very much for your time, guys. I'm available. Uh, obviously, you know, my contact information is on the website. If anyone has any questions or wants to know more, please let me know. Thank you. Okay, so moving on with our agenda, um, item E, unfinished business, and we have one item from the Director of Parks, Recreation and Heritage, the BC Games. Welcome back, Willa. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, so on April 27th, Council directed staff to participate in a conference call with BC Games representatives on June 10th uh, to obtain further information regarding hosting BC Games. Uh, so staff attended the call on June 10th, and at this time, staff recommends council to direct staff to strike a bid committee, appoint a member of council to participate on that bid committee, and to give the bid committee the opportunity to select which BC games to apply for. Thank you. Um, Councillor Haggard. I'd like to nominate Councillor Polson to sit on this committee. You beat me to it. <laughs> I'll second that. I was going to second that. Councillor Paulson, do you accept? 
I will bring my extensive expertise in this area. Not, uh, yeah, no, I'll, I'd be more than happy to uh, sit in on the committee to begin with. And Madam Mayor, I remember him saying that when we were discussing this in the beginning. Or you got a Something memory. similar. Thank you, Councillor Paulson. Um, we recognize you have a lot of experience in this area and are happy to have you representing us here, assuming this motion passes. So it's been moved and seconded that we um, that we develop uh, that we direct staff to strike a bid committee to develop an application for the 2024 or 2026 BC Games. And further, we appoint Councillor Paulson to participate as a member of the bid committee. Moved and seconded. All in favor. Any opposed? <laughs> Carried, thank you. <laughs> Councillor Paulson cannot be opposed. Um, okay, moving on to item F, accounts is the first one. Councillor Washington. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I move the certification of Director of Finance to late dated July 27, 2020 be received in checks numbering 146465 to 146541 inclusive and payments of accounts totaling 1,345,000 $745.16 be approved. Second. Thank you. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Carried. And on to item two from the RCMP detachment. We have a report from the officer in charge um, reporting on second quarter, on the second quarter statistics. Welcome. Good afternoon. Can you all hear me? We can, yes. Great, thank you. So we're just gonna start right away. It's, uh, this is a review from April 1st till June 30th. Uh, as you can see on the front page, I summarized like four quick points as far as like the total calls for service that we received. Uh, just over 3000 calls for service out of those 2600 or 2598 of these calls were uh, within the city of uh, Port Alberni. Uh, the number of criminal offenses are down by 16% compared to the same quarter last year, uh, mainly related to property offenses, which I'll discuss a bit further uh, when uh, we get to breaking down the uh, different crimes. Uh, so the number of break and enters are down by 66%. Uh, unfortunate mischief for property have gone up slightly by 13%. And I will discuss further to the number of domestic violence reports have gone up drastically from 14 to 28 during the, the, the quarter of April to uh, June 1st. Uh, the second uh, portion of that front page discussed our annual performance plan priorities, which have been discussed in the past, I think by Sergeant Dion, uh, road safety, uh, family violence, uh, crime reduction, obviously focusing on Aboriginal policing and uh, uh, increasing our presence in school, which obviously has been difficult with COVID, but trying to, we have reestablished a youth officer position and trying to uh, work harder with a relationship between the RCMP and the youth in our community. Um, if you go further down on a report, all the calls for service have been breaking down in uh, uh, different type of crimes. So again, uh, it's comparing to uh, the last uh, four years from 2016 to 2020. I'm going to mainly focus on the second quarter between 2019 and 2020. And, uh, and uh, so for that, I mentioned total calls for service have gone down slightly from uh, 3,000 to just shy of 2,600 calls. Um, the biggest differences I've seen that we've seen this quarter is uh, if you look at um, violent crime, I've down, gone down slightly. Uh, property crime, uh, like I mentioned, down by 16%. Uh, you look at uh, other criminal codes, slightly up by 18. Uh, drug offenses are basically the same. And like I mentioned earlier, the total criminal code uh, offenses have gone down from 771 to 652 um, when we compare the two quarters. Uh, you look at violent crime, uh, it's just breaking down basically all the property, uh, sorry, all breaking down the violent crime. So uh, assault. Uh, went down from 58 to 39. Uh, we've seen a slight increase with assault with a weapon. The numbers are quite low, but it's still uh, up by five calls. <phone rings> Harassment are uh, gone down to seven. Uh, we've only had one robbery between uh, uh, April till June. 
um, sex offenses, sexual assault, sexual interference calls have gone down drastically from 14 to three. Um, if you look at uh, uttering threats, uh, 29 to 24, and then we uh, look at domestic assault, domestic violence, and uh, we've seen the, like an increase by 100% from 14 to 28. Uh, if you compare the, that number for the last four years, it's a fairly high numbers. Uh, it could be explained for different reasons. Obviously, uh, uh, what, what happened with COVID has been an issue for sure. Uh, we've seen an increase, obviously, like uh, uh, incidents of domestic assault, like you can see there, uh, as well as we have a really good, strong uh, cooperation with all our stakeholders when it comes to domestic violence. So the other thing too is we received a lot of uh, reports like third party uh, reporting. So that uh, now that we do add to our statistics, so that may explain some of the numbers, but uh, that's something we're working hard right now with our stakeholders as well as with uh, Maria or uh, domestic violence uh, uh, officer at the detachment are trying to pinpoint the reason as to why calls have gone up so drastically. Uh, now, if, if we break down property crime, uh, all again, all the numbers, like I mentioned earlier, have gone down uh, quite significantly. Uh, you look at auto theft, bike theft, uh, theft have gone down from 19 to 8. Uh, if you look at break and enters, you put them all together, they, they all gone down business, residents, and other. But uh, like, so if you add them up together in uh, 2020, uh, between April 1 and June 30th, we only had 17 break and enters. And the same quarters last year, we had 50. And a big reason for that is the work done by the members, especially our crime reduction unit, has been focusing on prolific offenders. And I'm sure you're all well aware, like it's a small group that commits probably 60 to 70 percent of property crimes uh, when they're away and uh, or complying with their bail conditions and have the freedom to roam around at night. Uh, that's explained some of the, wh why their numbers are fairly low. And I was quite pleased to see that uh, because it's always been a struggle to probably need to deal with property crimes. And uh, unfortunately on the flip side of that, we look at mischief to property, which is usually known as vandalism. And uh, calls have gone up at 88 to 101 and 101 is a fairly high numbers when you compare it to the last four years. And uh, Possession of stolen property has gone down drastically. Uh, shoplifting as well. Um, theft from vehicles, uh, pretty similar, 77, 75. Uh, fraud have gone down 38 to 17. I think a big aspect of that is a lot of education. Uh, we've seen a bit less of, uh, especially online fraud. I think people are more aware of the typical uh, fraud schemes, like a CRA emails and that type of thing. And uh, when you look at other criminal code, um, cause disturbance, 68 to 91, uh, breach probation, they're fairly similar. We've seen an increase of breach of bail. Basically, it's uh, an individual gets released by a judge, put on different conditions. And uh, what it kind of reflects on why our numbers have been kind of lower on, uh, when we look at property crimes is our crime reduction unit officers as well as our general duty officers have really focused on those prolific offenders. And uh, uh, we're, th we're looking at uh, curfew checks, um, checks of uh, compliance with different conditions. And that's what we've seen, uh, an increase in breach of bail, which uh, it's linked to the, the, as to the reason why we've seen a reduction of uh, break and enters uh, within the city limits. And for provincial statutes, uh, intoxicated public and public, uh, we see they've seen a decrease from 66 to 39, and uh, that's a quick overview of the numbers. Uh, obviously, the numbers are uh, I'm quite pleased at looking at our stats uh, this quarter. Uh, we're working really hard to uh, stay on the same path for the next quarter, and uh, I'm. Opening the floor, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you. Are there questions from council? Councilor Solda. Just a quick one, comparing to um, other communities our size on the island, how are we comparative? Because this, it's, this looks pretty good and um, 
it could get better. But um, how are we doing? Well, I can. Uh, I didn't compare with a lot of other communities, but coming from Comox Valley, I always try to compare with Courtney or uh, Comox, and uh, the numbers have kind of gone the other way, which is good. Uh, I was worried that we see quite a drastic increase in, in crimes, and uh, we're really at a really good quarter. So we're trending the right way for uh, you know multiple of reasons. Obviously, it's more than just uh, the work of the RCMP, but uh, uh, no, we're looking pretty good compared to some of the communities I look at anyway. Okay, and so some of these figures that we're looking at, and I know there's a, a different way of recording, so some things could be higher because of the way it's recorded in that now. Um, th there's nothing different here. I, I, it's done the same way, isn't it, still? Yeah, so the only thing, that's what my comment mm -hmm. about, like comparing 2016 to 2020, yeah. unfortunately, the stats weren't taking the same. But if you look at 2019 and 2020, it's exactly the same. So okay. that's why it's so important to really compare last year. And uh, the plan is for the future now from 2019 up that uh, I'm not aware of any changes coming on as far as like, the way we're going to keep uh, statistics. So uh, that's why I'm always cautious when you look at uh, 2016 and there's such a radical difference is because just the way uh, the statistics were kept at the time. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's good to finally have um, the year over year of consistent, uh, you know, information being recorded in the same way so we can really see where we're at. Um, and, you know, always nice to, you know, look at what's happening in other communities to see if we're, you know, trending up, trending down. Um, not that we want crime to be happening anywhere, but um, it is nice to see a lot of these key numbers going down, especially some of the areas where we have had a lot of challenges like property crime. Um, and I think for a long time in our community, um, you know, both the RCMP and service groups and the city and some of our initiatives have been working really hard to focus in on some of these areas. And it's, it's great to see, um, you know, some positive results coming in. We have a lot more work to do still, obviously, but um, trending in the right direction is fantastic. And then, of course, um, you know, seeing some really um, the, the most concerning one to me is the relationship violence number going up so significantly. And I know that, um, you know, on a couple of calls that I've had with ACAUSE, Alberni Community and Women's Services during the pandemic, this has been a concern that they've brought forward several times is um, so many people being kind of more isolated in their homes without the resources that they normally have. And just, um, you know, that concern for relationship violence where people normally can leave and can go out and can, you know, lean on their supports where they need to when they're living in unsafe situations. They don't necessarily have the same ability to do that right now. So um, I'm always happy to hear that the RCMP is, you know, honed in on this and really understands the significance of it. And I know we have a great team of people in the community, both within and, and outside of the RCMP working on this. Um, any other comments from council? Okay, um, would somebody like to move a receipt of the report? So moved. Motioned. Second, okay. Madam Mayor. Moved and seconded. Um, with that, all in favor? Carried. And thanks very much, Inspector Rochette, for the report. Thank you. Moving on to item three from the Director of Finance, we have a report um, providing information on the RCMP Emergency Reserve Fund. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So with the RCMP uh, annual um, funding, we, we plan out and we have our budget for 34 members every year. And often we don't meet the target of having 34 members. So uh, we usually have a surplus for the, for the policing costs in the community. With that, we had set up a, a fund in 2014 to cover uh, those, those unexpected costs such as an uh, investigation and at that time, we set a limit of $1 million for uh, this emergency uh, uh, reserve fund for the uh, community policing and R the RCMP. With that, the, the fund uh, reached the $1 million. And, and last year, the council provided the direction to increase that fund up to $2 million. Understanding that, that we uh, have improved the community policing uh, funding in the community. And we also have some outstanding expenses that we need to address, including green timbers. That, that's uh, close to $200,000 of outstanding expense. There's also uh, the wage increases that go back to 2017 
for the RCMP members, which is around uh, $611,000. And there is a liability outstanding for the retirement benefits that will need to be paid. And we have the option to uh, um, pay these over the next 10 years. And that's just over uh, half a million dollars. So with that, we, we see a few exposures to the, the reserve fund, but, uh, but we are still at that $2 million limit uh, once we make that transfer over to the reserve for the 2018-2019 uh, surplus that we realized last August. Uh, we also will have the, the, uh, the annual surplus fairly shortly for the 2019-2020 year. At that time, um, we will have to uh, make a decision on what to use those funds for, understanding that we do have some of these, these uh, exposures. But with that, uh, staff is recommending that we have a look at, at drafting a, a bylaw that governs the use of these funds moving forward and gives us the, the ability to, to, uh, to have that, that, that strong governance over these funds moving forward, because it is a significant amount of money. But uh, these funds are taxed for, for, uh, for the policing service and uh, staff will bring forward a, a bylaw, draft bylaw, should council agree with this recommendation uh, moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. I see a question from Councillor Solda and then Councillor Corbiel. And then Councillor so, Wilson. Madam Mayor, so when the fund was set up, originally it was because of the murder that happened in Campbell River and the million dollar invoice they received and that's why that motion was made all those years back to make sure the community would not have to put a bill of a million dollars and obviously those years ago a million dollars is not enough the second thing is this whole thing when I sat on the province with the RCMP Discussions were with Green Timbers, RCMP, the retroactive pay, and of course the um, the other retirement benefit. Um, unfortunately, Green Green Timbers, when it was built, there was no dollar. There was no. Uh, here's what you're going to pay to the communities, and that's we called it the Taj Mahal because they just spent, 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 and um, and it's unfortunate that we now have a $188,000 bill after all these years. It should have been settled to me. Uh, RCMP, retroactive pay. I thought the city of Port Alberni had put money away in a kitty or in a reserve, let's put, to um, help with the um, retirement benefits as well as the other um, dollars that are going to come out of. So I'm, I'm really disappointed in that fact. And I'm disappointed in the federal government coming back and handing us this bill. And I'm sure the uh, provincial appointees now with the RCMP have discussed this. And I just wanted to bring that and say how I felt on that whole thing. It just bothers me a lot on this. It should have been settled years ago when I we were on that committee. Thank you, um, Councillor Corbeil, and then Councillor Paulson and Councillor Haggard. Yeah, question to Andrew. Will all communities be getting something very similar to this? And, uh, you know, I'm kind of uh, of the mind that maybe, um, you know, somebody like the UBCM should be sitting down and making sure all this makes, makes sense. It wasn't too terribly long ago that Williams Lake uh, their CAO, who's a former RCMP inspector, uh, brought up a, an issue regarding um, severance. And uh, I believe the community uh, ended up paying considerably less for their RCMP uh, policing. So Andrew, is the, uh, to reiterate, is this a question or is this something that all communities will be facing? And secondly, is there an avenue where someone can kind of lobby on our behalf? Um, Madam Mayor, to Councillor Corbeil, the, um, the funding is, or the, the, the outstanding costs are allocated based on the number of members that we have in each community. So this is for all of E Division, so all of British Columbia. These costs are, are split up with, with that allocation of, of how many members we have in each community. So, so it is all of, all of British Columbia. And I'm, you know, I'm not familiar with the the lobbying or, or the work that has been done in the past. Um, I might defer to um, 
the CAO to answer that question. Madam Mayor, um, <clears throat> to Councillor Corbiel's question, uh, UBCM does um, interact with, with the RCMP on, on municipalities on the behalf of local governments in the province of BC. And our engagement of the RCMP is subject to an agreement between the province and the RCMP. So these matters have all been, I believe there's some supporting documents um, attached to the report. Um, these, doc these, these items have been, um, have been uh, basically um, negotiated out. Um, some of them have, um, some of the challenges when, when an issue comes along, we, we go back to the agreement, the contract and see if it was, if it was anticipated by the agreement and if not, um, how does the how does the agreement affect the issues that are arise? And so we are represented provincially by, by UBCM. And and to the point of um, severance pay, I'm not aware that any local government has avoided that issue. Um, I recall Councillor Corbeil um, pointed me toward a, a, a news report, Williams Lake, and and uh, there were two items in the news report, one of which was severance, and the other one was, um, I believe, a surplus similar to what we're talking about now. Thank you. Councillor Paulson. I guess uh, what I found disturbing in this report is, and I know that we can pay this over time, over five or 10 years or whatever, but I'm wondering if our 2 million is, is not enough. Uh, our exposed costs right now are over $1.5 million, uh, which is three quarters of, of our reserve. If you add up uh, the green timbers, the IHIT, there's Three or four others, but those exposed costs are um, are over one point five million dollars. Anyway, just a comment. Uh, and just to follow up on that, um, I know you know. It, we always have um, costs like, for instance, the fire department, you know, we know um, that we at some points we, we know when to expect severance pay and things like that and we budget for those. Um, I wonder if, if we're having a conversation about creating a bylaw for this fund, if really we shouldn't have a separate fund for costs that we know we're exposed to that we, you know, are going to budget for or fund um, from the reserves or, or from the excesses that we receive back rather than having it in this fund because to me it seems like two separate purposes exposed costs that we're budgeting for and that you know we know that we're going to have down the road those should come right off the top of the RCMP um, surplus that we receive back and they should go into an account first costs we know we have second it would make more sense to me to have then that excess fund that we determine what to do with but to have um, you know, those funds mixed in with this fund is I think just a bit misleading to, to how much there actually is to work with. So um, it, we can talk more about that if, if council agrees with that or not in directing um, a bylaw to be created. But to me, it, it makes sense to possibly have two funds. Um, I have councillor Haggard and then councillor Solda. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I was quite shocked when I read this and the amount of money that we're expected to pay it just seems to come out of the blue. And when we had excess funds, I thought, oh, good, we're really doing well here. We can use that for other costs associated with policing. And now where I'm finding that we're not going to be short, but we have a lot less money than what we anticipated. Like they just, the, these numbers just come out of the blue or we weren't aware of it or like, how did this all happen that we weren't aware? We didn't know before we got this report. The CAO is going to tell us that we were aware. <laughs> Go ahead, Tim. No, I was Madam, Mayor, Madam Mayor, I won't, I, won't, I won't tell you that. Um, so the city was aware of some of these costs. Um, being, we, we knew that we were in a retroactive wage situation, as an example, and we knew some of these other issues were being uh, negotiated out. And I don't recall that they were ever brought to Council's attention. So, uh, Madam Mayor, it's, um, I won't tell you that you already knew. I don't know that you did. It, the um, the one that I'm talking about is the um, the wage piece of it um, mm -hmm. that we had been made aware at a previous meeting that um, of of that portion of the funds, um, but yeah, there's some additional costs here for sure. Um, Councillor Solda, yes, and um, just to say the UBCM provincial RCMP team. They, 
they're sworn to secrecy. Like we have to sign papers and stuff, so you can't say anything. So all the stuff that the discussions and that they're, it's been ongoing for years. And obviously I thought it would have been settled by now, but it's not. And the piece with the um, green timbers and stuff like that, that's been an ongoing thing. And there's been um, discussions going back to Ottawa regarding this, the, uh, and RCMP, there's been a lot of discussion. I agree with you, Madam Mayor, about the two funds. There should be two separate funds because one is for something totally different that we hope never happens in our community. And the other one is obviously there's some little ongoing costs. And we also have to look in mind that eventually we might have to get cameras for each of our members. That's going to be a cost. Who knows? I'm, I'm talking about body cameras. There's been discussions on that. We don't know if that's going to be a cost to us. It was with rifles when they put the rifles in the car. So I think that we should have a separate fund totally. Thank you. So I'm going to suggest that we move forward with staff's recommendation to um, for staff to draft a bylaw on this, um, except that I believe we should explore having two separate funds and looking at, um, you know, maybe staff could bring us back a recommendation on what the two funds roughly could be responsible or could be um, you know, allocated for, um, and then from there we could direct a bylaw because for the fund that is for the extra money, um, rather than the fund that is for allocated or, you know, expenses that we are anticipating, um, I would like council to have a conversation on um, what that extra money should be for, because I know traditionally that money has been for saving up if we have a murder and I, or, or a major, um, you know, investigation. And I am of the mindset that although that um, we need to have money in savings for, you know, if something like that were to happen, I also think we should be making a priority of investing in um, crime prevention and investing in, you know, non-police crime or um, community policing, crime reduction and things like that. And I know that's a big piece of our strategic plan. So to align with the initiatives in our strategic plan. Um, I think it would make sense to have this fund be a combination of, you know, money to use if something does go wrong, but also in the meantime, not just sitting around and, and waiting for something really bad to happen, but um, trying to invest in the now and invest in um, reducing the crime that is currently in our community. So um, I think that the motion that we have uh, probably captures so that staff, well, staff draft a bylaw to govern um, the use of emergency reserve funds. Um, does council want to just proceed with that motion or should we make a slightly different one? Okay, seeing nothing from council, um, I will move that I council- will second. Okay, that council directs staff um, well, actually, CAO, could you give us some guidance on if we do want to split this into two separate funds, which I think is more appropriate personally, um, how we would move forward with that? Madam Mayor, the Director of Finance has heard every word um, that Council has said. And when he comes back with a draft bylaw, I'm, I'm confident that it will reflect the essence of this conversation. Maybe not in two, two separate funds, but in, in some sort of recognition for um, or funds that are siloed. I, sure. I, I think this motion gets us there. Okay, perfect. Um, then I will move the motion as written. I'll There's second that, Madam Mayor. Wonderful. Um, any further conversation? Okay, seeing none, all in favor? Carried, thank you very much. And item four from the Director of Finance, we have the audit committee report. Madam Mayor, if I, if I may. Um, can we um, consider an agenda of change? Yes, sorry, I, uh, I meant to say that. Um, the CAO has asked that we move forward item G1 um, as it's time sensitive currently. Would council yeah. support that? I can okay. explain why, Madam Mayor, we are, um, depending on, on the direction you give us on that item, we, we need to make a deadline for the local newspaper. Um, and if we don't make it today, we're, it'll put us a week behind. We don't want that. Okay, so um, I'm seeing consensus on council to move out, up item G1. Um, so we have, we have the manager of planning, we have a development application. Welcome, Kayla. Thank you, Madam Mayor, thank you, CAO. 
Um, so before you counsel for consideration is a procedural question with regards to zoning bylaw amendments for 5859 River Road. So an application has been made to amend the zoning bylaw to rezone a portion of 5859 River Road from the RR2 semi-rural residential zone to the R1 single family residential zone. And the permitted uses in the R1 zone are the same as the R2 zone. And the proposed zoning bylaw amendment is also consistent with the official community plan. The purpose of the application is to facilitate uh, simply a lot line adjustment to ensure that the existing driveway uh, on one of the adjacent on the adjacent parcel is is captured fully within the boundary of that neighboring parcel. And then as a result, 5859 River Road would be a completely vacant lot that could be sold and developed. No additional lots are going to be created through this process. Um, it's just a lot line adjustment. So Council has pre previously given first and second reading of the bylaw amendments. Uh, and since then, all outstanding conditions are in the process of being met by the applicant. Uh, the application is now able to proceed to the final stages of consideration. So to allow for public input prior to file final readings of the bylaw amendments, either a public hearing can be scheduled and held or public notice slash input uh, process can be utilized. So given the current uh, COVID-19 pandemic, we're recommending that city council utilize uh, the authorized process outlined in section 6462 and section 6, uh, or 467 of the Local Government Act to waive the public hearing requirement for this application and proceed with giving public notice. So then no in-person meeting would be required, but there would still be an opportunity for the public to inspect the bylaw amendments and provide input to council in the form of written letter or email. So uh, staff are seeking direction from city council to determine whether or not they'd like to proceed or how they'd like to proceed with this application, either by way of public hearing or by way of uh, waiving the public hearing and giving public notice. Thank you. Are there questions from council on this? Councillor Solda. It's not a question. I'm just moving to the, um, the that the city of council waive the public hearing requirements for proposed zoning bylaw amendment number 385859 River Road Ellen in accordance with the section 4642 of the local government act LGA and provide public notice in accordance with section 467 of the LGA prior to the consideration of further readings of the bylaw on August 10th 2020. Second. Madam. second. Okay moved and seconded any further comments? Seeing none all in favor. Any opposed? None opposed, carried. Thank you very much. And Thank Caitlin, you. is this the only one that is time sensitive? Yep, that was the only one. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. Then we will move back to item four from the Director of Finance, the Audit Committee report. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So the uh, Audit Committee met on July the 6th and they had some questions regarding the uh, the audit report. So the questions were uh, were made note of, and we followed up with the attached uh, uh, the attached information associated with those questions. So it's for council's review, and uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Are there questions from council? Councillor Corbiel. Yeah, you identified that there were no. Um, no vacant building permits. And, and I wonder why that is. I, I know there's two, if not three different definitions for vacant buildings. And I'm wondering if that isn't part of the problem uh, or do the vacant buildings in Port Alberni not meet that criteria? I don't know if anybody can answer that, that question. Madam Mayor, I can't answer that question. I would have to defer uh, to yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if that's something that Gaylene would be able to answer um, on the spot or not. We could certainly um, ask it, and I'm not sure if Gaylene is on right now, um, but we could um, ask the CAO to follow up on that. Thank you, Madam Mayor. We'll do that. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Solda. Uh, regarding the community gaming re revenue. Again, I'm really worried about the future. Like we have no idea when um, uh, Pacific Rim is gonna open up again or the, the gaming center. And um, I just think organizations need to realize 
it's going to be a little tighter. It could be. We don't know. We haven't had a discussion on that, Madam Mayor. So it just worries me a little bit. Yeah, I think that's a very, you know, fair concern. Um, we rely on those gaming funds um, as other community or other community organizations do as well. And um, the, you know, going away shortly of those gaming funds is going to cause significant challenges. And I'm sure that, um, you know, we certainly are aware of it. Um, and I'm sure that other organizations that rely on them um, are as well. Um, but yes, it doesn't make it any less of a concern for sure. Any other questions on the audit report? Okay, uh, my only question is that, um, and I, I think it's been touched on, but um, we are still, one thing that we were going to work on was a, um, was a terms of reference for the audit committee. And I'm just wondering if um, we have kind of a timeline on that. Yes, Madam yeah. Mayor. So um, I plan to bring that forward to the next audit committee meeting on August the 10th, and then we can follow up with a report to council hopefully in September. Okay, so um, I just wonder if that should go to the audit committee or if that should come to all of council. CAO. And, and I guess the, the, the uh, you know, clarification is we don't have a terms of reference for the audit committee, so we don't know if it should or should not, but my feeling is it's a, a committee of council, so I'm not sure if it, the terms of reference should go to the committee rather than all of council. Madam Mayor, I would suggest that the um, that we take input from the audit committee at their next meeting on aspects that they want to see that they would want to recommend to council, and that um, the draft document come to council first. Great, that makes sense. Okay, seeing no other questions, would somebody like to make the motion? Councillor Poon. Yes, I'll move that the report dated July 22nd, 2020 from the Director of Finance responding to questions arising from the July 6, 2020 audit committee meeting, the minutes from that meeting, quarterly analysis of mayor and council travel and convention expenses ending March 31st, 2020, the financial statements ending March 31st, 2020, the vendor check register report ending May 12th, 2020, and the investments report ending May 15th, 2020 be received. Thank you, is there a seconder? Okay, seconded by Councillor Washington. Seeing no further comments, all in favor? Carried, thank you. And item five from the economic development manager, we have the ice tea small capital restart fund funding. Welcome, Pat. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, so uh, council, uh, we're looking for uh, direction on, with respect to ice teas small capital restart funding program. That program was announced on June 4th a number of communities have taken uh, advantage of the fund and I've listed uh, the projects uh, that have been uh, approved uh, in the report to you. It so happened that we were already calling uh, businesses in the uh, community just in the days uh, leading up to the announcement of that uh, fund. Uh, and we actually ended up phoning uh, 94 businesses in the community, uh, 50 food and uh, beverage, and 44 retail. And uh, we asked um, if they were uh, needing access to public spaces uh, or other revenue generation opportunities, which is uh, what the fund is established for. And um, of the 94, three said yes, 13 said maybe, 41 said no, uh, and the rest I did not return a call or uh, an email on this. So based on that, uh, we prepared uh, an application for uh, eating spaces uh, in Harbor Key, and um, then heard from uh, council uh, that uh, you would uh, like to see some consideration uh, given to 
the uptown area, which figures more dominantly in your strategic plan. Uh, so on June 30th, uh, seven of us, uh, five city staff and uh, two chamber staff uh, did a uh, business walks. Uh, we visited 44 businesses uh, in the uptown area. 23 surveys were completed. Uh, 21 businesses were either too busy uh, or were closed or the owner was away. Um, and uh, the result of that uh, was that uh, the businesses were telling us that uh, lighting uh, for security uh, and ambience uh, purposes uh, was um, the highest priority uh, that they would put. Um, and the second were uh, additional flowers. I subsequently got in touch with uh, Lynn Robert, uh, the um, CEO of uh, the Island Coastal Economic Trust, and uh, talked about uh, the initiatives uh, that we had in place. Uh, she uh, advised uh, that uh, lighting alone uh, would not uh, qualify for the funding, uh, nor would uh, flowers, uh, but that if um, we were creating public spaces um, and uh, providing lighting or flowers in uh, conjunction with those public spaces, uh, that it would qualify. Uh, but the, I might point out that the uh, uptown merchants that we spoke to were really concerned about losing parking spaces. Uh, so um, uh, at that point, um, we decided to turn to council for uh, direction. And just before I do that, um, I'd like to um, thank uh, uh, Melissa Tardif, uh, who did the phone survey, and Sean uh, Burgoyne, um, who's been redeployed in part uh, from Parks and Rec for uh, his assistance in meeting out uh, uh, with the business community. And um, on that note, uh, ask uh, Council for direction. Thank you. Are there questions or comments from Council? Councillor Haggard. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I was wondering if the economic development manager could give us a sort of a summary of what your projected plans are for Harbor Key. Uh, sure. Uh, at, we um, uh, set up some uh, tents uh, immediately uh, in those uh, early days of June to assist in providing additional uh, eating areas uh, for uh, the restaurants and the coffee shops uh, that were down there. And um, those uh, tents were uh, alone and some of them are in uh, rough shape. So the intent was to replace uh, or return the tents, uh, buy new ones, but also provide some um, additional uh, welcoming spaces uh, in those areas. Uh, uh, Parks and Rec, uh, Sean and uh, Willa had uh, budgeted um, about 31,000 uh, for the initiatives that uh, would be taking place down in there. So we would be adding some tables, we would be adding some um, uh, garbage cans, we'd be ad adding a recycling area. We would also be taking a look at what ice tea had approved uh, for other communities with those additional spaces and see if there was anything else that could fit uh, the intent was to maximize uh, our access uh, to uh, the uh, $15,000 matching budget. Thank you. I believe that, um, I can't remember if it's the last budget or the budget before, but Rob Goodrow did have plans for a patio down at Harbor Key. 
uh, it's probably more costly than $31,000, but it might be more worthwhile to dig out that plan and see what it looks like. Will do. Thank, Thank you. you. Other questions or comments? Councillor Solda. Yeah, just down on the other side of our community, um, Victoria Quay, there's, there's been a lot of people coming in and where I am and they're going to picnic. They're having picnics and stuff. Instead of going outside on a patio restaurant, they wanna go and do a picnic. Can we not put in some more picnic tables down at that area? Um, I'm just hearing that from the community that comes into our business, right? And they're just going in for a picnic and they wanna enjoy the waterfront. So how can we do both? Do we have money to do both? I'm not saying a lot of money. I'm just saying some, you know, some money. Uh, we we could do that. The intent of the uh, uh, Harbor Key tenting area was also to provide some uh, additional picnic areas. And I would uh, like to tell council that uh, the city and the Port Authority and uh, the Sashot uh, First Nation have met uh, to uh, talk about increasing um, the uh, food trucks uh, and the picnic areas at uh, Cludesy Haven Marina. So uh, that area will, within the course of the next uh, couple of weeks, I think uh, be providing additional uh, picnic areas. Uh, but we will also take a look at Victoria Key. Uh, there is uh, no limit to uh, what uh, the municipality can uh, spend or invest uh, on initiatives. Ice T's uh, funding is limited uh, to $15,000. And um, Ice T did point out to us uh, that uh, Lady Smith. Uh, spent um, considerably more uh, than just the matching funding uh, that they had uh, requested from Ice-T. Um, their investment uh, was uh, uh, quite a bit more so that the percentage of the ask from Ice-T itself was not 50%, but a much uh, smaller amount. Long way of saying yes, we'll take a look at it. Uh -huh. It's just a lot of people gravitate to what the Rotary put up, the shelter and, and the picnic table. And I'm just hearing such great things about that and they would love to see something else. So, thank you. Councillor Haggard. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Pat, is there any limit to the number of applications that a community can make? Because you did list Capital Theater in here. So I'm wondering if we could do our own application in the Capital Theater, if they had interest, they could do their own application to something they wanna do as well? Or is there a limit to the number of applications and awards in the community? Uh, there, is, uh, there is a limit, there's, there's one. However, uh, the municipality could uh, make uh, that application and um, so one limit for the municipality or one application, uh, the cap, uh, Capital Theater, uh, if they so chose, uh, could make an application uh, for um, their equipment. I have forwarded uh, the news releases uh, that uh, were done for the Sid Williams Theater mm -hmm. uh, and the Tidemark Theater to uh, the uh, to Peter Wieno. Peter was. Uh, forwarding them to the board of the theater, so he um, uh, they they would consider that. Great, thank you. Thank you. Are there other comments? Okay, seeing none. Um, so requesting council direction. Um, so council, we can. There's a number of options presented here. Um, I think the simplest is to um, you know go with kind of the work that was initially suggested um, at the Harbor Key. Um, we could direct Pat to do anything we want here. <laughs> Councillor Haggard. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, after we 
uh, pass the motion to extend the pandas at Harvey Key. I congratulate staff on how quickly that they did it. And it does look very good, but it does look a little unfinished. So I report um, expanding the Harvey Key key area and trying to finish it up, make it look like it be really belongs there, not something that was just kind of thrown together. Um, I did talk about Third Avenue, but we, uh, we're going to be doing a review of our strategic plan priorities and Third Avenue is going to be in there. At this point, I don't think Council really knows what we want to do with Third Avenue or what direction we want to go. There's a lot of small things that we can do up there, but until we have a plan, I don't think that we should be applying for funding. I think we should go with what we're working on now and try and finish it and make it look nice. That's my suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. And do you want to make a motion on that? I will make a motion that we uh, direct our economic development manager to make an application to ICT for the Harbor Key eating area. A second. Thank you. And my comment would be, um, I, I mean, the Harbor Key is the jewel of our community. It's a beautiful spot. We want people, you know, down there and enjoying it as much as possible. Um, I have to say that I some I feel somewhat sensitive as a business owner in the community to um, feeling like sometimes things are provided for businesses in that area that aren't provided for other businesses. And so I would just ask that we are very cautious with what we are applying for um, and that that be for, you know, permanent improvements to that area to facilitate this type of thing that we all want to see. Um, and less so about things that typically businesses would have to buy and pay for themselves, like tables and chairs and shades and things like that. So I think that there's a lot we can do down there to enhance it for everyone. And I think we just have to be cautious to not be, you know, specifically supporting um, some businesses and not others. And when we do have a cluster of businesses down at the Harbor Key, it gives a lot of opportunity to, you know, build up around that cluster. But we also want to be cautious to not give um, benefits to some businesses and not to others. But I'm excited to see this, um, you know, kind of progressing. And I think that we've all wanted more um, seating areas and things like that um, at the Harbor Key. And it's been a topic of conversation for a long time. So I think that COVID has given us a great opportunity to make some real improvements down there. Councillor Solda. Yeah, I would agree with you, Madam Mayor. I just, the only thing I have concerns is I would love, if we're going to do all this, I'd like to see the businesses be open together instead of stagnant they are. I've been down there a number of times and there might be one or two businesses closed when everybody else is open. So I think we need to get that into a check too. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, then on the motion, all in favor. Carried, thank you very much. And moving on to to item G2 from the Manager of Planning, development application for 4202 and 4238 8th Avenue. Welcome, Caitlin. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, so before you for consideration are uh, some procedural questions with regards to zoning bylaw amendments for 4202 and 4238 8th Avenue. So the city is in the process of considering zoning bylaw amendments uh, for these two properties to rezone the properties from RM1 low density multifamily residential to RM3 high density multifamily residential. The permitted uses in the RM1 zone are the same as the RM3 zone and the proposed zoning amendment bylaw amendments uh, are consistent with the official community plan. The purpose of the rezoning is to allow for the redevelopment of the Woodland Village complex to permit uh, up to four new uh, five-story buildings with a total of 150 units proposed for the site. Council has previously given first and second reading to the zoning bylaw amendments and a public hearing was held on August 12th uh, of last year. Since then, new information has emerged um, following the public hearing. The applicant has requested that city council uh, consider removing the lot consolidation condition um, at this stage in the development process. And the reason for this request is because there are several property owners involved in the project um, which has created some legal and financial challenges with consolidating the lots. Um, so therefore this would, this having this condition in place uh, really puts the project in a place where it's unable to move forward at all. 
So since this discussion with the applicant, new development plans have been submitted that demonstrate um, how the development will be able to meet the RM3 zone uh, site development requirements as two lots. And it's always possible that through the development permit process, um, a, a lot consolidation could occur at that point in time as well. So with alterations and new information being brought forward, the next step in the rezoning process is therefore uh, to allow further public input and review of the application prior, prior to council giving final reading of the bylaw amendments. So staff are recommending in this instance that city council utilize the authorized process outlined in section 4642 and 467 of the Local Government Act to waive the public hearing requirement for this application and to proceed with giving public notice. Um, and, and the reason and justification for this is because a public hearing has previously been held and the overall use and design remain similar to the initial proposal. So we don't anticipate that the public opinion of this redevelopment project will have significantly uh, been changed or altered by this. And as well, because uh, similar to the other application that we had just considered, the project is consistent with the official community plan and therefore uh, a, public, uh, a public hearing can be waived by council. So if you do choose to proceed, uh, proceed as such, no in-person meeting would be required, uh, but there would still be an opportunity for the public to inspect the bylaw amendments and to provide further input to council in the form of either a written letter or an email. So in summary, staff are looking for direction from council to determine how, to, uh, how you would like to proceed specifically with regards to the lot consolidation requirement and whether or not to waive uh, a second public hearing. Thank you very much. Are there questions from council on this? Councillor Corbiel. Uh, Caitlin, why was uh, the uh, consolidation uh, put forward in the first place? What was, what was your concern? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so the initial purpose of the law consolidation requirement was because of the way um, the uh, the site was being proposed. Um, it wasn't going to be able to meet the requirements of the RM3 zone. And so therefore we had um, required that one whole lot be created in order for the development to meet um, the law requirements. With those changes that have been brought forward by the applicant, that's no longer a concern of staff. Okay. Are there other questions? Councillor Poon. Thank you. I have a lingering concern. Um, have the residents uh, been relocated? Are, are they still in place? And uh, have you spoken to the developers as to how the relocation process will be handled? Yes, thank you. Um, so no changes to the development or to the site have been uh, made at all. So there's, there's no changes or development happening at this point in time, this is really um, I guess the planning stage of the process and then further to uh, any potential rezonings being approved by council, there would still be a development permit process um, before any development and building permits could be uh, issued and any de uh, development of that site could occur. So we're probably quite, uh, quite a ways away still um, from actually getting to a place where the site can be developed. And from what I recall and discussions with the applicant to date, their, their plan um, was essentially to approach the site in, uh, in some phases. So not to disturb the entire site or everyone's living situation all at once um, and to try uh, to the best of their ability to accommodate existing residents into the new, uh, into the new property as it gets developed. Uh, we did have some uh, staff had some discussions with the applicant about potential housing agreements that could be um, registered and made to the site uh, in order to secure um, certain uh, units for those tenants in a more uh, legal and legitimized way, but that was not of interest to the applicant at this point in time, so they did not wish to proceed um, with that. Um, so that's always something Council could direct or make us consider. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay, would anybody like to read the motions as they're written? Councillor Poon. Sure, I'll do that. Uh, I'll move that City Council rescind the following condition, that as part of the development process, the applicant be required to consolidate the properties into one legal parcel prior to final adoption of the proposed zoning amendments. And- 
Oh, oh all right, go ahead. Let should I together? Should I continue then? Yes. Okay, and that City Council waive the public hearing requirements for proposed zoning bylaw map amendment number 35, 4202 and 4238 8th Avenue to build bylaw number 4993 in accordance with section 4642 of the Local Government Act LGA and provide public notice in accordance with section 467 of the LGA prior to consideration of further readings of the bylaw on August 10th, 2020. Thank you, is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Solda. Any further conversation on this? Seeing none, all in favor. Carried, thank you, none opposed. And item three, also from the Manager of Planning, development application for 5269 Pineal Road. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So uh, again, similar uh, before you for consideration today are procedural questions with regards to uh, an OCP and zoning bylaw amendment for 5269 Pineo Road. So an application has been made to amend the official community plan and zoning bylaw to rezone uh, 5269 Pineo Road from the RR2 semi-rural residential zone to the RM2 medium density multi multiple family residential zone and to change the land use designation from residential to multifamily residential. And the purpose of those changes would be to allow for the construction of one additional uh, small home at the rear of the property, uh, which I believe is going to be intended for the, uh, the use of a family member. Uh, so as the applicant is now near completing any conditions related to rezoning, um, they have requested to, to move forward in the process and uh, one part of that request is to uh, specifically consider allowing for a slight amendment to one of the conditions that was made around uh, the size of that proposed dwelling unit. Um, initially, one of the things that was requested was uh, a, a condition to limit the size of that building to 700 square feet. And uh, the applicant has just come back to us and asked if council would consider an additional 50 square feet. So um, making that building a total of 750 square feet. So if council supports the proposed amendment, uh, then the next step in the process is to schedule a public hearing in order to, in order to allow for public input on the application before uh, third and final reading of the bylaw. Um, the public hearing requirement cannot be waived for this development application because it requires that official community plan amendment as well. So staff are seeking direction from council to determine how they would like to proceed with regards to uh, the amendment to the proposed covenant to increase that, uh, that building by 50 square feet um, and as well as scheduling the public hearing. Thank you, questions from council. Councilor Corbiel. Just, just the point, um, and that's a fairly large lot in Vancouver, where if a lot is 50 feet or wider, you could have a maximum of a 900 square foot lane, laneway home. So this is certainly not a problem at all um, and probably uh, would uh, indicate that we, you know, we should be working on our laneway uh, bylaws sooner rather than later. Thank you. And at, in the ACRD as well, a secondary home can be, I think it's up to 940 square feet or something. So this is still, um, you know, well under um, what the Alberni Clayquot Regional District allows, which is always good to know just because, um, you know, they, the regional district is our, our neighbor. And so it's good to have kind of similar policies um, in both areas. Any other comments? Okay, seeing none, Councillor Corbeil, would you like to read the motions? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I move that a covenant be registered on the property to restrict development of the property to no more than one additional dwelling in addition to the principal dwelling and that the additional dwelling must not exceed 750 square feet. In addition, that official community plan amendment number 30, 5269 Pineal Road, Murphy, Bylaw number 5006 and zoning bylaw amendment number 39, 5269 Pineal Road, Murphy. Bylaw number 5007 be advanced to a public hearing on August 10th, 2020 at 630 at Glenwood Center. 
Thank you. And before we ask for a seconder, um, Davina, were you popping up to tell us you want us to read these separately or are they okay paired together? Uh, that's exactly correct, Madam Mayor. I was going to suggest that um, it, the, they should be separate motions. Okay, so we will just take the first half as um, as read currently. Is there a seconder for the first half? Second the first half. Wonderful, thank you. Um, okay, any further comments on the first part of that motion? Okay, seeing none, all in favor? Carried, thank you. And uh, would somebody like to read the second part? Councillor Corbeil, read it again. Yes, I will. That official community plan amendment number 30, 5269 Pineal Road, Murphy, bylaw number 5006, and zoning bylaw amendment number 39, 5269 Pineal Road, Murphy, bylaw number 5007, be advanced to a public hearing on August 10th, 2020 at 6.30 p.m at Glenwood Centre. Thank you. Now okay. everybody will really make sure that they're going to be there. We've read it twice. Okay, <laughs> moved and seconded. Any further comments? Seeing none, all in favour? Carried. Thank you. Thanks, Caitlin. Thank you. Um, no correspondence for action today, no proclamation. So on to correspondence for information, City Clerk. Yes, Madam Mayor, on behalf of Davina, I will jump in here and refer to the three items that are listed on the agenda for information. One being correspondence from the Honourables Mike Farnworth and Selena Robinson, and it is related to Bill 19, which was given royal assent on July 8th, 2020. And these relate to the COVID-19 related measures. Uh, this act will ensure that the province has a smooth transition to manage the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic beyond the end of the provincial state of emergency and to support BC's restart plan. The next item is to give council the heads up that the 2021 census of population questionnaire has been published on Stats Canada website. Additional in-depth look at census, its history, the laws that regulate it and how it is planned and conducted, uh, people can visit portrait or sorry painting a portrait of Canada the 2021 census of population online and as well for the latest 2021 census information and developments individuals are invited to visit their website the road to the 2021 census and the last item of correspondence is from the office of the chief medical health officer in that letter they're encouraging uh, that mayors and councils exercise caution not to consider alcohol a necessary requirement to facilitate social connection and enjoyment of public parks and communities. They are strongly recommending that if a local government within Island Health Service areas choose to move forward with plans to increase access or allow consumption of alcohol in public parks, that it be done on a pilot basis only and coupled with a health impact assessment and evaluation of likely negative unintended consequences. And they're offering that a medical health officers can be consulted for public health advice should you choose to go down that path. Thank you. Are there any items councillors have questions on or would like to comment on? Okay, seeing none, would somebody like to move receipt of the informational correspondence? I'll move receipt of correspondence one, two, and three. Okay, and is there a seconder? Second, Madam Mayor. Moved and seconded, all in favor? Carried. There's no report from in camera, so we have our council reports next. Are there any items councillors would like to speak to? Okay, seeing none, would somebody like to move receipt? So moved. Okay. Is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Haggard, all in favor? Carried. And that brings us to new business. Was there an item we were going to speak to in new business? Councillor Corbeil. Yes, I would like to uh, look at the feasibility of uh, employing a uh, structural engineer to do a seismic evaluation of the uh, train station. It seems to me that if we're going to be putting this out to tender and we've heard all kinds of uh, numbers, uh, some extremely high, we should really know what we're talking about. So uh, 
I'd like to talk about that, I guess, at the next meeting. Sure. So we could add that as an, uh, a notice of motion or just an item to be on the next agenda. And then if staff has any um, background information that they could bring, even just, you know, a rough idea of what it would cost for us to, um, you know, to do that, to get someone to do that work, it would be helpful during the conversation. Um, any other items councillors would like to speak to? Councillor Solta. Just a quick one, Madam Mayor, regarding the Arrowview Hotel. We had a letter from Aaron Bevril. I, I forgot it. Yes. Perfect. And I know some action was taken because this tenant who's renting the space next to the Arrowview had some concerns. So maybe we can just have our CAO just say what has been done. Sure. CAO, would you like to comment on that? Since it is something that has been getting a lot of conversation in, in the community. Yes. Madam Mayor, the, this matter was discussed by Council at your last meeting and um, we've been taking a hands-off approach with the, the owner of the Arrowview as, the, as he demolishes that building and what is left on scene and on site is um, a pile of debris that needs to be basically cleaned up and then a site made safe. And um, I believe I asked Council at your last meeting if you wanted to us to change our approach to how we how we were um, managing that that demolition project, and Council didn't change your direction to me. Um, I did subsequently authorize City Equipment to go in and move the debris off of the city owned land between the Arrowview and the adjoining pro property. So we didn't take any material off site; we just moved it off city land, and uh, we recorded the cost of that. I don't know if we can recover that or not, but we'll make an attempt. Thank you. Thanks. That's helpful. Great. Thank you. Councillor Hager, did you have your hand up? Yes. Uh, were we not going to discuss Canal Beach on your new business? Yes. Thank you. I was just going to call on Director Thorpe if she's available to um, provide an update on what's happening at Canal Beach because, of course, we received some correspondence um, con of concern from John Douglas. And I know I've heard a bit of concern in the community as well. So, just a, a bit of an update on what's happening with Island Health there. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. So when Mr. Douglas reached out initially, I, I responded him to him directly uh, that same day. And I indicated to him that we were in the process of working with Island Health uh, and our environmental health officer directly uh, on next steps. So we know that it's been a challenge with the, the testing results at Canal. It's, it's often, so we've been testing Canal for six years that I'm aware of. And often this time of year, we, we receive positive tests. So I'm looking at exploring what some longer term options would be so we can communicate with public so they know exactly what to expect as, as the summer, summer months approach. Uh, so currently we are testing weekly. Um, and so that, that period of time is generally mid-May to mid-September. So as I committed to Mr. Douglas that I would keep in touch as I had as I had more information, that's still the case, and I'm just waiting to hear back from the environmental health officer. Thank you. Are there questions on that? Councillor Corbiel. But as of now, there's a sign that says no swimming. Is that correct? Uh, Madam Mayor, I have not viewed the space today. I'll need to go take a, take a tour to confirm exactly the signage that is currently at Canal today. I was down there a few days ago and that was the sign that was there and uh, that sort of surprised me. And I, I kind of thought we were talking about swim at your own risk or something like that. Yeah, and so so Madam Mayor, just to clarify, that's uh, that's the language I'm waiting to confirm with uh, the, envi the environmental health officer is to ensure that we're consistent with the language uh, we're posting that would, would also be found in other communities as well. So we want to ensure that our messaging is consistent with our health officers. Uh, I'm not saying that it isn't at this stage, but this is what I want to confirm with them so that we are consistent in, in how we're testing our procedures and then also how we're communicating with the public. Thanks, and, and thanks for that. I think, um, you know, we all recognize the, um, the value of this space to our community and we want it to be accessible in it as many ways possible. And, and that includes people who want to swim there being able to utilize it for that purpose. But of course, first and foremost, we want to make sure that um, everybody using it is safe um, and that the city is, is um, doing our due diligence to make sure we're keeping everyone um, who's using that site safe. So thanks Willa for your work on that. Absolutely. And, and Madam Mayor, just to confirm as well that 
Um, any communication that the public does send uh, to staff, uh, they can be rest assured that uh, they would receive a prompt reply always, that uh, within uh, one or two business days is very reasonable for staff to, to reply. Um, and of course, if, if staff are, are unable to respond, we would forward them to the correct department. So I'm very comfortable that we are, are responding to all inquiries, including Mr. Douglas in a timely fashion. Thank you very much. Any further questions or comments for Willa? Okay, seeing none, thanks so much Willa for hanging on till the end of our meeting. <laughs> um, okay, council, uh, that takes us to question period. Um, City Clerk, did we have any questions or comments submitted? Questions, any questions? There are no questions, Madam Mayor. Okay, thank you. Then adjournment, would somebody like to move adjournment? Move. Uh, Councillor Paulson, quick to make that motion. And seconded by Councillor Solda, all in favor? Carried, thank you very much.